of June 24th. And I will entertain a motion to open the continued public hearing for Buckland Street and Leonard Street, the stormwater management permit, the and the petition to construct a paper street. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Come forward. Lou Petrosi for Wall Street Development Corp, the applicant. Uh, since we last met, um, uh, we attempted to uh, address some of the comments and concerns the planning board had at the last meeting. Um, one of those uh, concerns had to do with the <coughs> adequacy of turning radiuses yeah. for emergency vehicles exiting and entering off of Buckland Street I mean, off of Pleasant Street into Buckland Street. Uh, we submitted a turning plan um, at a prior uh, submission, but we also had an opportunity to speak with the fire chief, um, and he gave us the indication that though the turning pl plan that was provided uh, adequate turning radius was for his apparatus, his largest apparatus. Um, secondly, we uh, discussed a number of things relative to um, uh, the dead end street issue being a maximum uh, uh, longer than what your maximum dead end street requirement is under your subdivision regulations. Um, as I mentioned during the last meeting, we did reach an uh, agreement with the homeowner at 12 Maple Street Extension. Currently, Maple Street Extension is a uh, partially public way and partially private way that's um, over a thousand linear feet with no uh, connection, no turnaround. It also is a way that has uh, no hydrants and has a minimal water, I think a two inch water main in the street. So, uh, what we proposed is a uh, is a emergency connection between Maple Street Extension and the end of what we're proposing on Buckland Street, and also to uh, uh, provide fire protection in the way of a hydrant. Yeah. As you might uh, recall, uh, as part of this construction of Buckland Street, we will be installing municipal utilities, including uh, an eight-inch water main and municipal sewer in the street. And we will be extending the uh, water main as a result of our uh, revision to the plan. We will be extending the water main all the way down to the end of uh, Maple Street, uh, Buckland Street, where Maple Street extension intersect and providing hydrant uh, for fire protection in that. Uh, currently, there are no hydrants on, on Maple Street extension at all. So. Um, I think the chief was appreciative that we would be able to do that. And also uh, for his emergency vehicles on Maple Street Extension that were to come in, we are going to provide a similar hammerhead turnaround uh, as part of a, a driveway reconstruction proposal that we have with the homeowner to allow his emergency vehicles, if they were to come down Maple Street Extension, to uh, turn and exit Maple Street Extension back out. So currently that does not exist on the property. Um, and then also to really um, we leave his concerns, it was, you know, we've agreed to do a uh, sprinkler system in each of the homes to be constructed there so that um, um, in the event of a fire or emergency in that particular situation that the, uh, the sprinkler system that would be installed would give the fire department an extra uh, time frame for um, responding and in a lot of cases uh, save the property from being uh, overwhelmed with fire. Um, so those are pretty much, uh, oh, one last thing is we did add, I think one of the comments was for snow storage. Yeah. We did add a pro, uh, a, an area toward the back of uh, Buckland Street uh, where it 
intersects with Maple Street Extension so that um, there will be available uh, capacity to store snow. We, as part of our uh, home, as I mentioned before, the, um, the Buckland Street, as it's proposed, is going to be a private way with no responsibility for maintenance or upkeep to the town. Um, a homeowners association will be uh, formed and the homeowners association will be responsible for maintenance and any kind of repair uh, over time. And that would also include uh, maintaining uh, clean, adequate access between the two roadways in the case of snow removal and other uh, other responsibilities for also uh, snow removal. Yeah. Currently, as as I understand it, currently the town um, plows Maple Street extension, but just leaves the snow in a pile on the private property of the 12 Maple Street extension, and there is no a place for them to uh, proceed. I think we'll, you know, between where you see highlighted in blue there, that's approximately the end of what we uh, perceive to be the public way, since that's the area that's been paved. And then the remaining of that is, is a gravel drive. So when, um, in the event of a, when it snows, the town plows to the end, and then they have really a, nowhere to go. So we're hoping to create a situation that will make it easier for snow uh, transportation through the, the two streets. And that essentially is what, um, where we left off uh, as far as the petition for constructing Buckland Street. Um, there is a separate application for the stormwater management permit, which is separate from a part uh, than, um, from that application, so. Do you have um, any uh, formalization of that agreement with 12 Maple Street Extension? I do have a signed copy of that agreement, but I don't have it for public disclosure. Public okay. Um, okay. Mr. Paradis, do you have some uh, comments? Um, sure. Uh, generally, uh, we would not. Um, so, as, as it relates to stormwater, first of all, this is not going to change the uh, stormwater management permit. Okay. Um, the only and, and we would also defer to uh, the fire department relative to turning radii and uh, the ability to get up there. I would caution, um, and I don't know if he's taking a, 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 a good look at this, but the. That little piece on uh, the Maple Street extension is a fairly steep piece, about 15% grade. Um, so it may be uh, too steep for a grass and plastic paver type, um, you know, to get tr traction. Um, so I, if, if, depending on what the uh, Fire Chief says you may want to fill that little section with fresh stone as opposed to grass. It might give you a little more traction. Okay. Did you have any conversation with the Fire Chief on that? Uh, no, they, uh, Phil just brought the grade issue up to me uh, at one of our previous meetings, but we have no objections to adding uh, stone to give it more traction. I think our, our main objective is not to increase the impervious surface uh, in the area, given the nature of um, surface runoff being uh, uh, an issue of concern there. So I think we can um, certainly make it so that it has more traction. I think one of the things that Fire Chief and I discuss is certainly this uh, connection will not be provide an adequate turning radius for his large apparatus. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be that uh, type of roadway connection, but it will provide um, adequate turning access for four-wheel drive vehicles, police vehicles, and other emergency type vehicles that don't require the large turning radiuses of a 40-foot ladder truck or that sort of thing, so. Okay. Um, we actually do have the fire chief here. Okay, great. <laughs> 
Hey, Chief, thanks for being here. Good evening. Um, I'm not sure, I guess you want me to comment on the, the grade. So that was, um, that's new to me. Um, I think in the scheme of uh, the exercise that Lou and I did, um, not able to obtain normal access through the town bylaws. So I tend to start saying, okay, what are the alternatives? Yeah. So that's where we came up with the list that um, Lou wrote out. So I just do that exercise with everybody yeah. just to see what we can do and um, assuming that it can't be a normal roadway through, assuming that the cul-de-sac doesn't fit in the end there, normal and the length is too long. So in those alternatives and when I, the 15% grade um, is steep, but uh, in the whole scheme of things, the fact that the Lou's adding this 13D sprinkler protection to the homes, I still think we're in a good spot and I'm just calculating that mm -hmm. on the go. Yeah. Um, it does add some alternative access to Maple Street Extension if there was a wire down or a gas line down or something like that that I could potentially still get an emergency vehicle in from another way. So that exercise of how that can help the surrounding area in public safety, I think that's a positive. So in general, everything I've gone through with Lou, um, it looks to me to be a, a significant alternative safety program. Okay. That, that is acceptable in my view. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Phil, any, Phil, any further things you want to talk about for the open, any of the open issues? Uh, I think other than the conditions we recommend in our yep. letter. We're good. Okay. How about you, John? Um, you guys did see <coughs> Mr. Barbieri's letter. Yes. Well, I, I assume I we all did. I was just reading that right now. I'm uh, surprised it's not in the package. I couldn't see it in the package. So if something gets to us kind of past the deadline, we just have it separately so it doesn't get confused. And we had already sent out the package at that point. Can I ask you a question related to that? Of course. So the very point, the second point, Mr. Barberry makes, or the very first one I says, if the planning board has determined that Buckland Street is not a way in existence, why then would it approve a petition to authorize <coughs> the construction of Buckland Street if Buckland Street does not exist? So did I miss that, that we approved the petition? Was that the one meeting I was We out? have not approved the okay, petition. Okay, so that's, that's inaccurate. In front of us. That's inaccurate. Uh, I don't think it's asserting that we did it. It's asking why we would, right? Where are you pointing to? Is it in the most recent letter he said? Why yeah, then would it approve a petition? Right. Oh, okay. So I think I it's, it's asking, in the wording. Yeah, I yeah. think he's asking forward. Okay, okay thank you. Do that. Thank you. Uh, you mis misunderstood that. Can I ask a process question as I look around a nearly empty uh, dais? Are we, where are we with voters on this? I don't think you have a, a, a majority. That can vote. Yeah, we only have four that can vote, right? Mm -hmm. Is everybody? Are, you're, we're all still eligible to vote. Okay. And so, Gary, I believe, has not missed any. Right. And Mary has, also has not yeah. missed any, right? Yep. So they can watch. So they can be exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And what about Frank? Um, He's okay too. Yeah, okay. I think he was only questionable about whisper way. Okay. Well. All right. Um, but as a practical matter, we cannot vote tonight. Yeah, um, right. Oh, excuse me. Do, do you have two new members out of, out of on the planning board now. We do. Okay. Just um, right. Yeah. And um, in order for them to be eligible to vote, we would have to withdraw and start anew. It's certainly your choice, but okay. Um, okay. So. Um, I feel that I may have an older outline, so when's the last time we met on this? Was it May 13th? I think so. Yes. Yeah. I have a, a current outline. Look at me go. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a miracle or something. Um, okay, so um, we talked last time. I went back and reread the minutes, and I really appreciate um, your minutes. 
Jacoby. They're so detailed that it's really helpful. Um, and we did talk in terms of um, this, the voting members that are eligible to vote um, being rather substantially united in their support of the roadway being designed to the subdivision standards. Well, I think uh, when you break down the act, I mean, there's two parts of the equation for this regulation. The actual road itself, with a paved road, the paved, that's being designed and constructed in accordance with your rules and regulations. The issues that are related to the waivers, meaning the sidewalk, yeah. um, the trees. Yeah, we're going to go through that whole list of waivers. The ancillary items where we've requested waivers, particularly because of the width of the right-of-way doesn't permit some of these items to be included. The we, width of the right-of-way meaning? The, the, the entire? Actual, the actual right-of-way of Buckland Street, which is only the variable width. Uh, it fattens out in the middle, narrows in the ends. Um, it's really basically a 30-foot right-of-way. But um, as a practical matter, you own the property, right? Yeah, I own the property on the southerly side of, of Buckland Street when you enter. So we're fighting a couple of, uh, not fighting, but we're, we're wrestling with a lot of alternatives because the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction over much of the property. They want us to move things closer to Buckland Street to get it away from the wetlands with her on the southerly side. And now we have the planning board wanting us to include sidewalks and other things. It's not so much that we want it, it's what the rules and regs require. I understand. I okay. Understand. When we submitted the application, we, I think I mentioned that we just followed a similar application that was uh, submitted on uh, Box Mill Lane and another property that we had a copy of their application for a paper street construction petition. We sim simply mimicked the waivers that they requested on, in that uh, those applications. Those applications didn't include any sidewalks. Um, we do think that we could possibly install underground utilities in, in that area, so we would be willing to, you know, not all of the waivers are cast in stone. They just simply request based on feasibility that we're looking at right now. So, uh, but okay. the sidewalks would be one thing. The sidewalk grass strip combination is usually a you know five or ten foot width requirement, so that would extend well beyond the edge of the right of way. So we've designed it with a, I think under your regulations with a twenty foot width of pavement. I think there's a section or category in your subdivision rules and regulations for a rural. I, I can't remember the actual section, but I do think that the, is it a rural street or is it? A, does anyone know for offhand? So I do not, but I can see that. Rural, rural roadway, something to that extent. Yeah, that 20 feet? I believe yeah. so. Okay, so. We can double check yeah, that. So we did design this based on that uh, because there's only four houses uh, on the proposed roadway. Um, and the pavement width and other, uh, for example, the way the drainage is, uh, is designed, you know, the road is tilted so that all the drainage rolls onto our property, which in a normal roadway, there's a crown in the middle, the water disperses evenly on each, to each side. So we have the road, you know, pitched so that it enters into the infiltration uh, chambers on the side. Um, so if you were to put a sidewalk on that side, you'd be interfering with the whole design of the drainage. So you're telling me the sidewalk would interfere with your storm stormwater plan? I think so. I, I, I'm not the engineer, so I'm just relaying what I, my thoughts are with that. If it was put on that side. It, uh, uh, on either side or on that side? Well, on, this, on, on the northerly side, if you can see there's contours, the road is elevated slightly above the existing grade of uh, the adjacent property. And without an easement to enter onto the property, we, we have a, a, you know, sort of a three to one slope there, which is typical okay. on the, from the edge of the roadway down to the property to, to avoid having to approach this. So that wouldn't be a feasible 
location for a sidewalk that would require a retaining wall or a three or four foot high retaining wall on the whole line of property in that location. Um, where are you in the CONCOM process? Uh, CONCOM where it continued because I told them I was, you know, we're still waiting for stormwater management. Apparently. Continued to when? Um, 24th, I think. I want to say. July? Yeah. Or, no, well, we've been continuing. I think I'm going back to July 9th, and then depending on where we are. Uh, so the two things that were the, the Buckland Street aspect and the lots are on two separate notice of intents. So there's. Separate. I'm sorry, say that to me one more time. So the roadway is on one notice of intent. Yeah. And the construction on the lots are individually uh, notice of intent, so they're. They're um, separate. Does your petition to CONCOM uh, assume the waivers that you've requested? <coughs> it's, we've submitted the plan, <coughs> okay. the same plan that you folks have, they have, and we're trying to sort of sync them up as best we can. Okay. Um, yeah, questions? I should, go ahead. You go first. No, I'm, I've, I've asked a lot. Oh, sorry. No. I just want to correct me if I'm wrong. This is for you. Um, the gentleman keeps referring to a right of way but we do not recognize a right of way. So I would say that it's the standards for a new road right on his property. So, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe if we can weigh in. Uh, there is a right of way, right? That, that the, 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 but what we have not recognized is that it was a way in existence. Okay. And there's a distinction there. I believe so. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, so this, just for everybody's, um, if I can even add clarity, I don't know, for everybody's um, understanding. Um, this is a complicated question. There is um, what appears to be a roadway across much of that parcel. Um, what is not clear is that there, it was a road uh, away in existence out to Pleasant Street, which the Planning Board has decided you did not satisfy that it was not a way in existence. Um, so we are contemplating a, a constructing a road behind the, the Pleasant Street connection. Um, once you solve the Pleasant Street connection. Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. So there is a, a way shown on the plan that predates the adoption of your subdivision control law. So that way gives us the right to construct that way to have access and install utilities, separate and apart from the planning board process. When we started this uh, development application, uh, we had input from town council that asked us to design the road so that uh, it's in concurrence with the, as closely as possible to the subdivision regulations. So in, that if in we, concurrence, well, we have not said not in concurrence with subdivision regulations. Right. Just I want to yeah. make sure we all understand. So, in the event that we would then be eligible for an A and R endorsement for lots that might have frontage on that Buckland Street, so. In order for that a &R endorsement to take place at some point in the future, the planning board would have to determine whether or not that was a way in existence prior to 1953. Which we, which we did. So the planning board took an informal vote, because we haven't submitted any plans yet relative to that, and we have not submitted an a and plan. So the planning board took an informal vote that we recognize and we know that that could be the outcome, but there is, under an a and procedure, we would submit the plan, the planning board would likely turn it down maybe for the same reasons, and then we would have a right to appeal to court, and the court would decide whether or not it was a way in existence. So, so we did decide, we took a formal vote, if that it is not a way in existence according to the uh, planning board. I we, understand. That was a formal vote. So, so in the interest of discussion, this particular property is unique in that it has frontage on two streets, Leonard Street yes. and Buckland Street. Yes. So just for discussion purposes, uh, I'm sure that we have adequate information to determine that Leonard Street is a way in existence. Um, 
So then Buckland Street would be used simply for access purposes. And these, this gets complicated as you go down the road. It gets complicated. So it's, it's, uh, it's a unique situation in that the property has frontage on two paper streets or yes. streets. So for the purposes of our, rather than do a two-prong type of permit process, we decided to submit in, in as close compliance as we can the proposed roadway for Buckland Street and seek out the permits that were required. If just, just for the record, there is no part of your plan that <coughs> includes accessing those lots through Leonard Street yet. Correct, but if, okay. if, 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 for example, the process were to say we weren't required or available to have Buckland Street as an A&R endorsement, then that would require the subdivision control process to take place in which we'd have to submit a new plan and the planning board would have the opportunity to review that plan again in, mm -hmm. um, in connection with the other waivers that we are requesting. So that's like the next step in the process. If the planning board decided at that point that you weren't going to approve the construction of Buckland Street, then that would sort of uh, require access to be off of Leonard Street, would then put the Conservation Commission in a position where they'd have to grant limited project status to those lots for access. Well, I don't know what they would have to do in that case. I understand the challenge you face. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Um, is there anybody from the public who is here to speak on this? Mr. Terry. Madam Chair. Thomas Terry, 17 Maple Street. I want to look at the map first before I ask any questions, please. That's what we were just told. And that is going to be part of this, uh, what's going to be determined possibly of a, uh, a road called Buckland Street? That's correct. And in the future, <coughs> I'm going to go out of here. Would that block off the snow dump? Would that block off any possibility that I might? stormwater management basins that we have along the road right. as well. Will the snow be plowed that way too? In other words, will the, will the snow plow go down there 
and the tip is blade, and then go down a second time, the tip of the other way, we're going to put some on the other side. I, I don't know. I don't know the technique that they use, but it will follow the pavement. Well, the purpose of tipping the road is to get all the drainage and any any snow that might melt to follow that over to the other side. Of the Correct. Road, I would suppose if that isn't the intended to approach the road. Uh, I think it's a private. Uh, it, it, that portion of it is private. It's private. It's not, it's not, it's private right? Correct. I, I think that's correct. So, is there any possibility of vehicles making this 90 degree turn here, Chief? Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility in the future? Do you think we're going to this? Is that what we're talking about? So, it was presented to me that. The corner of the fire trucks would not make it the, the template that I give the applicant, um, and then I, I'm trying to make a judgment based on. Normally, we have a cul-de-sac at 500 feet for a limit, so this is longer, and I weigh that against adding a fire safety sprinkler system to a yes. home. And that's just kind of a model that's in 527, the CMR. That yeah. You do that kind of evaluation in certain cases. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just doing the exercise here, and, and to me, the um, the water that gets down to the end of Buckland with some of this access can potentially assist in through whatever maneuvers to help Maple Street extension. It could assist in in certain cases. Okay. So I just I just try to quantify that in my mind and say where are we? I think we understand. Thank okay. you. One last question. Yeah. You got in the snow dump. It's going to be placed here, and my property is here, and uh, the grade runs this way. Uh, when, when it melts, it's going to apparently be mine. So we will uh, ensure that the beta, that beta has, has agreed that the stormwater is managed on their site, which includes the snow. And for purity, too. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. So I'm mindful of the time. We are. Uh, excited about our 495 uh, discussion coming up next. Um, I just want to ask uh, one quick question. Um, have you talked to the DPW about the water main extension and the hydrant? Not particularly about the recent extension that we've made, but we did receive, um, at least for the sewer, not quite sure if it included the water, but the sewer extension permit was you, you totally want to do that before you yeah, come back. Absolutely. Um, and then, just from a process perspective, I don't know if anybody else feels like we're kind of circling around this. Um, if I understand it right, um, the question we need to consider first is whether we're going to approve um, the roadway petition and what standards. And then we could consider. Um, an A and R, and what we also just heard was that, however the roadway is designed, that could conceivably impact your stormwater plan. It, depending on the waivers, it could. Right. Um, so my proposal is that the next time we meet, we walk through those that list of waivers and we address the street, um, the petition to construct the street, and and that at least gets us a step. Um, one way or the other. Okay, when's our next um, opening? Um, so we have July 8th, we have something at 7.30, 8.30, and 9 o'clock. So uh, there's potential to start something at 7 o'clock or at, so 8.30 is a new hearing. Okay. Uh, so there's something. And at what's at 9? 9 o'clock is the growth study committee interviews. Yeah. So I don't know how much time you want to designate to that. Yep. 
<laughs> and what's at 7.30? 7.30 is the continued public hearing for Whisper Way. So right uh, now that's got an hour, but it's not designated for an hour. Right. Um, and what's our next meeting look like? I'm sorry? Next meeting. The 22nd. The 22nd. Uh, we have a hearing at 7.30, uh, which is 76 Main. 8.30, which is Maspinock Woods, and 9 o'clock, which is uh, the Eversource LNG line replacement. L I'm sorry, Eversource what? Line replacement, the pipeline. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> they just love hanging out with us. Oh, uh, have mercy. Um, all right. Um, I feel like uh, we need to constructively get through some of this. Is anybody willing to meet at starting at 7 at our next meeting? Yeah. Say it again. I already have all our meetings at seven. We'll take that as a nice yes. job, Deb. We'll take, awesome. We'll take that Long as a time yes. ago. <laughs> all right. So, um, so this is July 9th, Is that right? Eighth. Eighth. Thank you. I, I knew I was off. Okay. Um, and John, would you let the planning board members who aren't here explicitly know that we're going to start at seven ahead of time? It works for the applicant, right? I assume it works for the applicant. Okay. I'll come okay. at five. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So um, the decision would then necessarily be a week after that. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah. The one in your memo is incorrect. Oh. I think it says 24th. Yeah, that would definitely not be right. Um, okay. Um, so I will entertain a motion to continue the public hearing for Buckland Street and Leonard Street, the stormwater management permit and the petition to construct a paper street to 7 o'clock on July 8th. Sorry. It, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And the decision, is it, so what's the timeline on the two decisions? So currently the decisions for both of them, for the petition to build the road and the stormwater permit is July 1st. Okay, so they would be July 15th. Sorry, Amy. So are you good, yeah, good with second. that? Yeah. yeah. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And that's good with you? It's good with me. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good night. All right. I'm keeping my notes. For, um, just a item of question about the, um, we have a date here. This board actions for 1.4, the second paragraph, it says due by 524. Was it meant 624? No, so that was just, I highlighted it, but then unhighlighted everything without realizing. So I never changed it. Oh, okay. It actually should have been July 1st. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Alrighty. And sorry, Chair. 8 o'clock, the I-90, I-495 presentation. Just one oh. point on Buckland. Sorry. Line. So he has submitted the ANR. Um, he has. He has. So that it. I thought he said he hadn't. Uh, I think he it's meant. For Street for one okay, so either way, um, he has submitted an ANR. So that since the 21 day requirement starts ticking when they submit it, July 9th is when a decision is due on that. So at the next hearing, a decision as to whether you can approve that ANR or he has to go through subdivision approval yep. needs to be made. All right, let's make sure that we have that explicitly in uh, the, the notes and also let planning board members know because we need those voters to watch and come back okay all right so there is an a and i thought there was yes yeah sorry for the a and r everyone and involved. it's through leonard i believe it's oh, for leonard street in one accessing lot. in one lot yes um, and since that's a new submission yep. all members can vote on that yep yep okay perfect thank you sorry about that <coughs> dave thank you madam chair so, um, John, if you can get the presentation up when you get a chance. So the I-495 and I-90 interchange project is a project by the state of Massachusetts to do traffic and safety improvements on that interchange. Um, I have put together a little PowerPoint um, just to discuss some of the potential concerns for the town. Um, and we're just gonna go through that PowerPoint and I definitely like the, um, the opinion of the board as we go along and perhaps at the 
if we have time, we can ask the public if they have any input. Yes. At the end. So just, just to give a heads up, there's um, two different components of this presentation. One is directly related to the interchange of 495 and I-90. The other one is an a, um, emergency services exit on Route 135 that's probably about a mile or two to the west. So I just wanted to call that out at a high level as we're discussing, um, and we'll go through each of these. So the, the first page, the inter interchange concept notes the... Um, yeah. Sorry, it's, it's construction is expected to run to, from 2022 to 2026. Um, the reason for the project is well documented, like I said, safety and traffic concerns. So this presentation will not question that at all. We would just assume that the project's moving forward and we'd just like to supply some input, if we can, of how it will be designed and constructed. Um, and one of the concerns for the town of Hopkinton, this is my own opinion, I would like to get some feedback from the, the, the board tonight is that includes two flyovers that I was told would be about 50 feet tall and uh, would be visible from Roosevelt Farms and possibly the Oak Hill neighborhood. Huckleberry. Yes, Huckleberry. And a second concern is that they're going to be reconstruction of the Fruit Street Bridge. I can't remember the timeline, but I'm thinking it's a couple of years, but we can get some more particulars about that. But the bottom line is there's a serious amount of traffic that goes to Framingham through that. Um, so that will be uh, a big effect on not only Hopkinton but the towns west of it. The the Fruit Street Bridge, the big, the big bridge. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Over 495. Yep. yep. So just jumping to the next slide, um, they proposed three options. One kind of built on the other, and this is the third one. So it kind of has all the components in it. Um, each one of them. It, I don't know if you guys got a chance to take a look at this, but mm -hmm. you can see there's kind of two flyovers. Yeah. Um, one is Mass Pike heading west, going 495 south. I don't know if you can see that, but it's kind of a... South is at the top? Or? South at the bottom. Yeah, right. So right, upper right is headed to Boston, right? So you're coming out of Boston. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got the cursor. Nope, not there, down below. So the right lane. Yep, and coming down south. There you go, that, that arc there. Yep. Follow that left, that very first arc that's heading south. This is their map, by, by the way. My maps are coming up and they're even less <laughs> user-friendly than this. <laughs> there you go, that's it, perfect. So um, eastbound, you'd be coming in the, sorry, westbound from the east, you'd be coming in the right lane with a big bridge over the top and heading southbound. That's one flyover. Um, well, let's call that I-90 West, and then I-90 East would be another flyover heading in the north direction, the other complement to that curve. Um, apart from that, I think most everything else is your typical cloverleaf design, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if people are familiar with that. Um, some people like cloverleaf, some people don't. I like them because um, of the cost to build them and the cost to maintain them. There's usually only one bridge, um, so it's cheaper to build and cheaper to maintain. Uh, other people like flyovers because you know it, you you don't have to reduce speed as much, and you're pretty much just going at a steady pace. However, it's more bridges to build and more bridges to maintain over the life of it. So um, reduces weaving. Reduces weaving. Reduces weaving. So that's a, that's a good point too because one of the big concerns they have right now is the way they designed the Mass Pike because they wanted all the traffic to get to one side for the tolls. So that's why all four directions all come in together. And I think that in my personal opinion that's where a lot of their congestion and traffic happens. Whereas sim with a simple clover leaf that would solve a lot of that. Uh, might not be the ideal solution. So. Um, I, I really don't know how to move forward with this and what we want to do. I just wanted some feedback from yep. the, um, the team because there are, there are going to be some concerns about big, huge bridges being built in, in Hopkinton. So mm -hmm. I'm going to take Remind a pause. Remind me again where it is in the process. 
the design. Right now they're doing the design. So they did have a meeting, I think about a year ago. I was not able to attend it in town here. Um, I, I was thinking maybe it would be nice to have them come before us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Or send somebody to them. I don't know if they will come to us. Right. Um, they've been very receptive. They had a meeting in Westboro. They had a meeting in Hopkinton. They are looking for feedback. They want to involve the public. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to invite them. I think this is a, a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, what is the what is the hope for construction schedule? Twenty twenty two to twenty twenty six. Are you still going to be in town at that point? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Am I Getting out soon. No. Um, okay. So I did know just while you're thinking about that, just to add some fuel for thought, food for thought here. Um, you know North Street, and I think you were mentioning that I a lot of the traffic <laughs> that a lot of the traffic is related to the train station. Yes. However, I believe that a lot of the traffic is bypassing the Westboro Rotary, coming from Framingham as well. So um, I can talk about the second yeah. screen, which kind of addresses that more. Yeah. Right. Yeah, go ahead. So in, in October 2018, we had an informational meeting at Marathon School. Mm -hmm. in Huffington, in the, excuse me, as part of that announcement, there's a way to be added to their email list if anyone wants to do that. Um, so yeah. I can send that out. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Amy. It, it doesn't say, though, at if, if, what point in the design they were at at that point, if that was 25% or, okay. or do we Do we have any no. idea? No. So okay. I guess the big concern, in my opinion, from this interchange is just the height and, yep. and the view yep. to the existing neighborhood. So, yep. do you know if they talked about the um, Fruit Street Bridge? They did. And what did they have to say about that? So, um, they said that it's going to they're going to need to widen 495 and rebuild the bridge completely. Okay. And that's going to take. I'm guessing a couple of years, but yeah. I don't. I don't know. Do we? So I do have a, go ahead, I do have that, a, that bridge is going to be, there is going to be no bridge for a period of time? <laughs> or maybe they're going to build another one next to it, we can get some more details from it, but, um, so. They'll have to have a plan, but. So I have some, my next slide kind of addresses Food Street and traffic concerns, if we can hold that thought for a minute, but did anybody else have any input or questions about this whole design? Yeah, I don't know if I have a big opinion, just not being a traffic engineer or whatever about either the flyovers or the cloverleaf. Um, I wonder about, it does do the flyovers reduce sound impact to neighborhoods rather than extending out? I don't so, know. So we haven't prepped our, our town engineer, not town engineer, our, our consulting services, Phil, but perhaps he would like to speak to it just offhand. As, as far as what flyovers, do you have do you have an opinion? You want to jump in on an opinion on a preference? I, I know we haven't formally asked you to, to do this, so I apologize. But. No. Well, uh, um, I'm not I'm not an expert on highways, but I do know that you know uh, the the conf the weave conflicts are, are the ones that cause um, are, are safety issues and cause because you have to wait. For one car to, to pass before you know one guy wants to get off and one guy gets yes. on, so yeah. so the the flyovers uh, reduce reduce the conflicts. Okay, um, so from a safety perspective, right, and then also is, if, if it's noise, you know trucks have to slow down and and speed up when when, when there's a change in in, in, uh, in velocity acceleration, so. If a if a, a, a truck can take a continuous uh, speed mm -hmm. through the through the interchange, then that that reduces noise as well. So, I mean, the, you will be higher because you got to you got to pass three layers, three levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, it does I, seem like yeah. a rich area of discussion. For yes, the planning and, board. yes, and and I know that there are not many flyovers in New England. I know in other parts of the country there are very many, but I don't know if that's take that for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you, Phil. Phil. Can, you, can you go back to the map? Go ahead, jump back to the map. So the black lines, the curve that's going north and the curve that's going south. Those are the only flyovers? Those are the two flyovers, yes. Um, no, 
Yep. That yep. one there. Yep. As well, that. Yep. that no, nope, not that one. That's just a normal exit. That's not really a bridge at all. Okay, so wait. That, and that, that one. one there. Yep. yep. Okay. You can kind of see it because they both go over 495. My big concern. Um, um, I I, I um, drove 495 for years. I'm um, taking my son to school, and um, Soprano Drive has a bridge like that. It's not three stories. Yeah. But it's constructed of metal joints. And in the winter, it's treacherous. It, so what, is, it's, what it is is it's a two-foot swath of metal that gets very, very cold. And you have no control. Tires have no control, even if it's plowed, on that. Um, you're talking about the one in Marlboro, correct? Yeah. You're talking about the yeah. one on I yeah, actually yeah. use that exit entrance every day. So are you familiar with that? Yeah. I yeah. Do. It's 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 a little harrowing. The TJX home office is right there for not the home office, but the IT. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see a problem with the the ramp going on um, as long as it's, you know, um, sort of tethered or and there aren't many of those joints. But I'm wondering what they can do if we can have some kind of vision of what kind of joints are there. And is there any kind of action or prevention of, of that? Because it, you know, it, it is um, a concern, even though it's more contemporary. Yeah. I don't know if it's any safer. So. Correct. Um, and as far as the noise go, you know, I, I, I've been, you know, going back and forth from the satellite mode here on maps. And, um, Perhaps it would be a, a situation where the neighborhood could ask for some some um, walls for right. locking that. Soundproof barriers. So Sound uh, the only thing I've heard about the walls is that they um, they offer minimum protection and almost none past like the the homes that are closest to the walls. Right? They block it for those homes, but not necessarily the ones that are in. I don't know how much of an issue it is or how, uh, or how much of it is our issue, but it's... Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure because of the way it is whether, how, how, much of, how much they'll actually see. So we'd have to do a field trip. Maybe that'd okay. be a good thing. To okay, do, do you wanna, step. Yeah. yeah, so in the interest of time, why don't we just yeah. jump to the, the second part of the presentation um, where it says the following slides show two maps of the proposed, what I'm calling a, a half exit because you can get on, you can get off, but you can can't get back on. Wait, sorry, wrong. You, you can't get off, but you can get on. It depends on which direction it is. But we'll take a look at the map. But okay. Yeah, you'll know what I mean when I see it. Yeah. So the first map shows a heavy use of the traffic flow from Grappling up and blah, blah, blah. Second map, blah, blah, blah. I think if we just go to the map. Um, so the point being here, the, just to finish up. Sorry, yeah, sorry, no John. But the proposal will take a heavy flow of traffic off the back roads of Hopkinton and Southborough and get the traffic to and from I-90 sooner and more efficiently. And it could possibly be implemented before the I-94-95 project, which rebuilds the Fruit Street Bridge and it would have lesser impact on traffic. So this is my little sketch notes here. What you see is the back road there, Lake Whitehall on the bottom. Yeah. So top is north. So let's just assume you're commuting into Boston from Upton, Grafton, whatnot. Uh, Waitonsville, so you'd go by the lake on your right um, and you'd come to uh, this is where it currently goes now, it goes under 495. Correct? Yes, yes. No, it goes over 495 on the Fruit Street Bridge. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the Fruit Street Bridge goes over 495 and then down to like Woodlands who have to across back under the Mass Pike. And then up into Framingham, where that circle is, is the Mass Pike entrance for exit 12 with Framingham Sheridan Tar is. Okay. So that's pretty much heavy traffic area. Um, I've been doing that commute for a bunch of years. And we could do traffic studies on it if we had to, but I can guarantee there's a lot of traffic. So um, I think if you go to the next one. So this is possibly using the 135 going under the Mass Pike, the emergency exits is a little, these are my notes, so they're uh -huh. very sketchy, but 135 is going from the top left to the bottom right, um, and it goes under 490, uh, under the I-90 Mass Pike. Yeah. And um, the exit on the, the, 
the left side would be an exit coming out of Boston. So the rest area is kind of where that blue dot is, and you would take yeah. a, a, a right turn. The police, the state police do this yeah, all yeah. the time. They take a little right turn and come off of the access road and get back on the, to 135. And the, the other direction would be um, on the, the right side of the Mass Pike. There's just a little quick little entrance right there to get on. Um, you can probably do it illegally now if you wanted to, <laughs> if you're a really big hurry. Possibly. <laughs> So I've heard that it can happen. By, <laughs> by doing this, that would eliminate all that traffic going through back roads, through Hopkinton, through Southborough, through Framingham to get on the pike. However, I don't know how receptive the state would be because they don't like to have what I call like a half exit because right. you want to be able to get off and get back on. Is this a, is this this is your idea that you've heard? This is an about? idea that I came up with and uh, okay. I talked to Gary and he's thought about this himself before. For It's been talked about yeah. though. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure it has, right? Yeah. It's not my own original idea. But um, but it's not in front of the state right now. No, it's not. No, gotcha. this is okay. completely ground grassroots. But the potential with doing this is we could use this for just the Fruit Street construction if they needed to replace that bridge so this would be something we would like to talk to, I would like to talk to, hopefully we as a board, the, the project team, and see if they've thought about any of this. And is yeah, it, maybe we could ask what their interim plan is. Yeah. Right. Is, yeah. is, it, is it about yeah. a temporary solution? Is it about a permanent solution? It's just a, an, an idea thrown okay. out there. All right. Interesting. And it's, right, there's no, you can't do it from the other directions. Right. Um, and I guess we need to be careful what we ask for, right? I mean, because if you had an exit off and on, then that area, whole area, would be start to build it, built up with, you know, McDonald's and whatnot's retail because. Good heavens. Yeah, we didn't mean that's. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So what what do you what do you propose as next steps? I'm I'm interested in this too. So I think just to like I said, let's let's invite them out to one yeah, of our meetings and see if they'll come. If they come, let's talk to them as a group and get some. I'm be really interested to hear feedback from them. The what? <laughs> the Harveys. The Harveys. Have you spoke, may I ask, Madam Chairman? Yeah. yeah. Has, has uh, Mr. Paul spoken with any of the Harveys regarding this? I, I have not, but I do know in the past that they asked the state for an exit just for their trucks, and it was turned down. This is not a So I'm going to, if you actually are going to speak, you have to come up to the mic, Robert, that's all, because nobody can hear you at home. So I have to go over here. Yeah, you, if you have if you have ongoing questions, I'm sorry, I should have had you come up before. Sure. Okay, so I'll do that now. Yep. Hi, I'm Robert, and uh, my question was, Madam Chairman, through you, if uh, Mr. Paul has spoken with the Harveys at all. He answered that uh, that he no, but that he knew they wanted this in the past. Yeah. So I think that's the next step. Maybe they have yeah. have a contribution. <coughs> <laughs> well, they certainly, it's a good point because they can certainly use it for half of what they wanted, right? Because lot, I'm sure a lot of their traffic is back and forth to Boston and we get a lot of their trucks off of the back roads. So, so that's a great point. Thank you for bringing it up. You know, while I'm here, may, may I mention one more thing? The last time I was on uh, Cimarano Drive, I recall there being a, a uh, Jersey barrier about this high. So that's below the mufflers and exhaust of most vehicles except for big heavy trucks, I guess. But uh, so that would dampen a lot of the noise if that's going to be how they construct these flyovers. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but Jersey that's worth Barry's asking. pretty solid. Well, I can't, you know, think of going up 495. I've never seen the wheels of those of the traffic right. that's on those ramps, those no, flyovers. you're right about, you're right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm pretty yeah. sure. But thank you very much for letting you me got it. So Just a quick summary. Um, thank you for that. That's great. So for the 495-90 inter interchange, that's happening and we just want to do what's right for the right. town. Right. That's pretty much, not for the people using it, because we all have a vested interest in that, but really the people that live near there. Yeah. And the, the second suggestion there, this little half exit on 135, the next step is, I'm not sure what the town of Hopkinton feels, like whether they want either. that or not. So yeah. I'm not sure if that's something we'd want to kind of do before we approach. Yeah, I have guys. no idea yeah. and I don't know the best way to find out. I suppose yeah. having a conversation with the DBW right. and asking them at what, you know, what the history of the conversations were, if they have any 
Yeah, I can, I can do that. You want to do that? Yeah. Do you, uh, it, it makes sense to me, um, if you're willing, for you to take point on Definitely. the scheduling and, and, um, and working with Definitely. I would love um, to getting do that. them in. So. Certainly. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Um, we blasted past 820, but we will come back to that. Um, do we have um, uh, Mr. McDowell coming in for the Wilson Street drainage? He called me today. <clears throat> called me today and was aware of this, but I don't know if he's okay. coming in or not. All right. So um, we can Phil could present. He yes. No, we're good. we're totally going to have Phil present. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Paradis, if you will come forward and give us uh, the overview on the Wilson Street, that would be great. So we do have the 820 Growth Committee, are we? Uh, the oh. Growth Committee, we're going to push that off. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. So, um, I think the last discussion we had a few months ago, um, you asked us to look at the uh, soil test data that was provided yep. for... Uh, the soils that were on site for to the trails at, uh, at Legacy Farms uh, relative to um, concerns from an abutter. Yep. And so we did so in the, um, so there was two, two particular, two particular uh, reports um, that we reviewed um, and generally, although the, you know, there is an issue with uh, contamination uh, of, of dyed diadrine or something. Yeah, huh? I'm not sure. So dialet deldrin. Huh? Dialdrin. There, there, there you go. There we go. Together Dialdrin. we got that. There you go. So um, and there was no. Uh, so there was a report done in um, in 2017. Um, and there were several tests done. They did not, ex they did not exceed um, exposure levels when they were combined together, and that's typically how they do it. They do a... a um, Buying the results? Yes. So, um, so and then, uh, so subsequent to that, we had, because of the, the uh, erosion issues relative to um, the, the rainfall that, and also the site was cleared, um, we did some water uh, soil tests uh, for the water that I mean uh, um, uh, the surface soils, and they were they were also not uh, they did not exceed um, uh, uh, issue, uh, uh, thresholds for for concern. <coughs> so, uh, however, because dialdron is is um, is persistent. It, it doesn't it doesn't deteriorate quickly. Mm -hmm. You just got to be concerned about uh, erosion uh, or the, uh, being attached to soil particles and mm -hmm. such. So, um, and right now, um, I talked to Peter Bemis again today uh, to talk about his his the, the the site there, and I went up to visit it as well, and about. 75% of that site is now uh, vegetated. Uh, so, and, and we've also been monitoring the um, stormwater pollution prevention reports that have been coming out of there uh, as well. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the major issue for that site is, is kind of diminished as long as we can continue to monitor and um, um, make sure that uh, he keeps his erosion controls in line. So for that site is the Heritage Properties site? Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, the additional drainage that was supposed to be, the additional drainage was going to be installed or something was going to be made deeper. Did, has that happened? So no, I, I don't believe it has. The, the additional basin yeah. I'm not sure what what okay. Roy is doing in terms of that schedule. Yes. Uh, and what happened to the pile of topsoil that um, was sitting in a huge pile by the street? Did that get spread out? And is that 
Is that chemical still on there? So there's a big pile in, t oh, there he is. You can come on up. <laughs> I didn't even see you come in. Yeah, I, traffic was tough. I think they're repaving Route 9. Uh, hi, Roy McDonald, Legacy Farms. Uh, for the two questions, the basin, we'd like to get started after the 4th of July. So that, that's something in progress. That loan pile. When after the 4th of July? Say again? When after the 4th? Uh, I'll check tomorrow with the contract if he told me after 4th of July. So is it the four, Is it the 6th, the 10th? I mean, it's somewhere in that. I'll find out. Okay. So yeah. how about this? Before July 15th? Yes. I'll okay. make sure. Time I'll make, certain. I'll make sure that happens. All right. As far as the pile, I know they've been doing some grading up there. And I think it's their intention to move it into other locations fairly soon. Again, I don't have a specific date, but I can find that out and report that to the planning department. So, so the question with it was, does, it, does that pile have that chemical because it was on the top surface? Um, it's my understanding it doesn't. I know they did some soil testing and gave it to the CONCOM. The CONCOM wanted some additional soil testing done. I believe that pile is part of it. And I will find out on that one also. Can I ask who they is? Who did the soil testing? Uh, Vin Gately's company. On the pile? Yes. When was that? Um, again, the pile, I don't know if they've done. I know they've done the site. And the CONCON requested additional testing, which I know they, if they haven't done it, I know they're doing it soon. And I'll make sure they include the pile. And, when, and can we set a date through the chair can we set a date for for us to find out when that research is because it's been months now I think it would be help I think it would be helpful if you tell me you'd like to get the next three weeks because I can report back to Mr. Gately you want it in three well, weeks let's just pick July 15th sounds good okay I will make sure I relay that to him first thing in the morning and who oversees testing of that nature that's an LSP a licensed site professional. For the town. Well, it's not for the town. It's it's. Who a, it's, oversees it for the town? Well, Testing of that kind. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is when you hire an LSP, it's like hiring a surveyor. They, you may be paying them, but they're going to do what the law says, not what you want. I think you can yeah, verify. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, th it's their licenses online. So. Okay. All right. So, yeah. to the chair, I, I have one question. I just want to refresh her a little bit. The soils were supposed to be left on the site, but the soils that have been found on the top, what, inch or three inches, six inches, have the chemical on it. Was the intention to, some of the soils had been removed? What was the history with that? I'm getting a little bit fuzzy because it's been a while. Tip, typically what happens is if you have tainted soils and Phil can, probably clarify more so if you have tainted soils typically they're taken somewhere to an approved landfill or approved site typically mm -hmm. um, in the instance here I think that was the case I know the um, the Deldron which was in specific areas uh, was dealt with and it's in the ransom report I, I don't have it with me so I don't recall the exact details uh, anything that's allowed to stay on a site can stay on a site. Anything that's not allowed has to be taken to an appropriate facility. Can, Maybe you want to clarify. Through the, through the chair. Yep. Can we have that documentation of where that material went and how much actually went? Is, is that in the report or is it possible to get that information? I, I can get you a copy of the report, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Is that the ransom report? <coughs> Do you have is that already? The ransom report? Say again? Is that the ransom report? Yes. Yeah, so we have that, and Phil oh. reviewed that as part of this letter. Oh, okay. So we have it. Um, I don't know if it's included in your materials, but I can, if you want to see the actual report, I can get it to you. Yeah, I'd like to. Thank you. Okay. Any, anybody else? I see. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just point of clarification. Uh, when Deb asked the question, was the pile tested? He says yes, but then... Three sentences later, he said he doesn't know if it was tested. Has the file been tested or not? I think I misunderstood. What I was saying was there was testing done on the site. I, I wasn't sure of the pile specifically, but I will make sure they do test the pile specifically. And then we set a certain date certain yeah. for July 15th. Sure, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I got that loud and clear. Um, okay. Um, if you can uh, give us a couple minutes, I'm going to recognize Katie to come forward, sure. and then we'll go from there.
Katie Towner, 9 Kruger Road. So that ransom report I submitted with a letter several months ago, so you all should have it. Um, I got it through a Freedom of Information request. And it documents the presence of the Deldron chemical. Um, it documents the methodology used to establish its presence. Mm -hmm. And it concludes that the results for the test area apply to the entire parcel. So no matter how many times we say that it's only in one spot and it, it's not there, blah, blah, it's there. It's the whole area. Um, the testing that has been done since <clears throat> was as a result of the uh, mudslide that occurred last fall um, by the heritage properties. And at that time, the CONCOM um, issued an order of conditions that an independent tester test those soils. And that has still not happened. So the, the arrogance with which the order of conditions is, is not followed there's a chain of custody. When you do, when you do a, a test sample, there's a, an independent person has to collect it, and there has to be a chain of custody. And that was not done. The contractor collected the sample. And um, the, I, I got freedom of information requests on all of that correspondence. And there were letters written saying this is not in compliance, and, and they ignored them. There were more letters written, and they replied, hey, we're in Florida, you know, we really, maybe next so spring. So they is Heritage Properties? Heritage Properties. You? I'm just clarifying. Yes, Heritage Properties. Yeah. So there's been a flagrant disregard for even the most minimum of standards with regard to testing. So, I mean, and the purpose of the testing, let's be clear, is not to establish the presence or the absence of the chemical, because that's already been established. Mm -hmm. And the EPA has already weighed in on the conditions for this mm -hmm. property, that, that that soil cannot be allowed to move off the property. That's not in question. What this additional testing was is to establish whether or not it, it migrated to the Hopkinton Reservoir mm -hmm. during the mudslide. So, you know, no matter how many times we try to kind of cloud the information and not be clear. So anyway, the, the, the place is contaminated. All right, and it's just a matter of um, what was the, the date of the, the mudslide, Katie? Huh? What was the date of the mudslide? Uh, it was in, it was in uh, October. Okay. It was in October. So, um, yeah, I, I have all that. That's all, that's all been collected yeah. on a shared drive because it's all been shared with me. Yeah. So it's available to everybody. Um, I also have all the EPA records for the investigation they conducted about all the soil moving off the site um, and coming back. <laughs> I have a CD of all the um, EPA records for that case, so I can share that with people as well. So um, back to the, um, this, this basin issue. Yes. The, um, the, the main point about that is that um, in 2018, Beta wrote a, um, a failure analysis of the original design of this basin. And they concluded that the composition of the soil that exists on that site is not capable of draining yep. at the required rate. And that is the root cause of the, of the problem. So um, the, the process that we went through to get a, a valid engine, and, and, and they concluded that the, the stormwater report had, had, was using the wrong types of soils, they were using the wrong types of rake, the arithmetic was wrong, it was just a complete not good piece of information to base any decisions on. So the, um, the, the process we went through to get to an actual design that was credible uh, took four iterations because after promises, promises, we're going to come back, we're going to make it right. We, we got one piece of paper with no engineering on it, then we got a couple of pieces of papers, then we got a no-show, all right? We got a couple months delay, we got another no-show. So finally we got something um, and it was voted on and it was credible. Um, it contained the, um, it replaced the substandard soil 
with the bioretention soil, which is like sandy soil, so that so that um, water will actually drain, mm -hmm. and that the contaminants which come from the road and just one more minor point about the, the relationship of the contaminated soil on the parcel to what is being captured in this basin, okay? We have multiple documented instances of this contaminated soil being tracked out into the road. It's a regular occurrence, and it's been a regular occurrence over the past five to six to seven years. And there's no reason to believe it won't continue as construction circumstances, you know, evolve. Um, Elaine wrote a 10-page uh, memo, Elaine Lazarus wrote a 10-page memo documenting sediment tracking onto Legacy Farms Road this past spring to remind the contractors. I submitted pictures of the, um, they're supposed to clean up every day before they leave, mm -hmm. anything tracked on the road. And, you know, I, I would go up there every day, I live there. So I took pictures on a Friday afternoon and she wrote the 10-page memo What's saying the date of that the date just so we can look I can look back I think it was in March March it was in the spring but I could, I have it I can send it to you she sent it to me okay um, so um, so that that was a documented instance of sediment tracking and that this is you know and she she went into detail about how these mountains of soil they blow onto the road they blow onto the road, they get tracked by the large vehicles. There's, there's many ways that they happen and the, con and, and the contractor is responsible for, at the end of the day, making sure it's all off the road because if it rains, it's all going into the wetland. It's all running off. So the argument that we don't have to worry about contamination because the only thing going into these basins is road runoff is, is not credible either. Okay, so that's the only point about that. Yeah. So the... Um, Can I ask one more question? This, um, this road tracking material is not just going to be from heritage properties, right? Right. Okay. Right. There, but there, there's multiple examples. They, they have their own big pile of, um, of um, topsoil. Yeah, that, no, I, I just wanted to make sure I was following it right. the whole way. Right. Yep. And the, um, the overland, um, the, the, there's an overland flow because of the topography, yeah. overland flow onto Wilson Street of stormwater. And you can verify that because there's a stream bed there, uh, multiple pictures that we've all submitted. There's a stream bed there with exposed rocks, so you can tell that erosion has occurred. And it occurs, it's been occurring for the last five years since they cleared Wilson Street with all the trees. And it's located next to the one tree that's still there. The one tree they didn't cut down, <laughs> that's where this, the stream bed is. So anyway, getting back to the basin, yeah. um, digging a deeper ditch in substandard soil will only serve to create a pool of stagnant water at a at a somewhat deeper, six inch deeper level. So um, the standard, the EPA standard for stormwater structures is that they drain in 72 hours following a rain event. And this has never been the case for this, these structures um, constructed on Legacy Farm Roads and Wilson Street. So, so that is the standard. It is th this, this whole, um, um, a, obliteration of the the valid design can by saying you, we'll just dig it deeper. Can I ask is, you to tell me the pieces you started to talk about the credible design? I took four iterations. What are the major functioning pieces of that credible design? It's the um, <clears throat> the uh, bioretention soil. Yep. It's the. Um, that, that's mainly it. It's the okay. bioretention soil, and then there's an outfall. Um, so the, the bioretention soil captures the contaminants, and then uh, the water uh, drains, and there's an outfall pipe where go, the clean water is discharged to the wetland. Okay. And uh, the design change that happened was... Is to remove... Um, the requirement for that soil. They, they kept a very small... Um, 
Um, uh, you don't even know how big it is because uh, Mrs. Marlowe asked for a side-by-side -side comparison of the, the original size and the new size, and I never saw it. You know, the, the, when, they, when they changed the design, they did not do it in such a way that it could be properly reviewed, which was her point. And, and you know, I studied it for many hours trying to figure out, um, I still don't know where the pipe is going. You know, and I asked that several times, that, that outfall pipe. In the new design, it looks like it's coming out the top, which is absurd, because the pipe has got to come out, you know, where the water is clean. <laughs> and then, you know, be pitched so that it goes out. But anyway, you know, I spent my many hours examining the design and, and I didn't think it was properly, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you couldn't make a side-by-side -side comparison. You, and that was Mrs. Marlowe's point as well. Okay. So in conclusion, the, um, the, um, this whole, cry to dig it deeper, make more volume is, is, is not a credible solution and it's only going to create a pool of stagnant water, a mosquito breeding. Um, every couple of years you hear about, you know, some member of our community coming down with a mosquito-borne illness, which, which, which are devastating. They're life-changing events. And so, um, you know, creating a pool of stagnant water for mosquitoes to breed in, um, you know, I mean, this is not, this has been going on for over a year. Yeah. We've been talking yeah. about this for over yeah. a year. I got and you, Katie. And you'll have another shot at this if you need it, but we're going to move, we're going to move back to what we need to request. Yep, okay. that's it. Thank you. Um, okay. So if I remember correctly, the design changed through somebody at the planning, not you, John, I'm not looking at you when I say this, but somebody approved it at the planning office without bringing it forward. Is that, do you remember? The stormwater design? A slight change in the, in the basement. Yeah, I'll, I'll go this way. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Totally fine. No, John is brand, yes, I, I know. Yeah, it was actually pre-you. Uh, so we actually had, uh, we had VHB look at the plans. In VHB, this is, by the way, the reason we haven't done anything is because we've been waiting to have this conversation. It's the only reason it hasn't been started. The, we had VHB look at the plans again, and VHB, after further review, thought a wide, by the way, the, the basin we're proposing is larger, not smaller, larger than the originally proposed. Grants has a little less soils, but it's a larger capacity, and they feel it's a better functioning system. So we had, that designed, we submitted to the planning board, Beta reviewed it, I'll let Phil speak for himself, but my understanding was we thought that Beta thought it was fine and we were gonna proceed to do it. And that's where we, that's Can I where, ask you, did the CONCOM mandate an independent tester? Say again? Did the CONCOM mandate an independent tester as was represented for this, uh, after the slide in October? Well, the, the independent tester is, is doing it for CONCOM. And when is that happening? Again, that's what I told you, you want it by July 15th. I'm sorry, I am totally... Are you talking about the LSP? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, but... Um, that should, by the way, that should have been done by now. I don't know why it hasn't. I'm not yeah. in control of that, but I'll make sure tomorrow the message gets through very clearly. All right. All right, and then we also talked about the, the basin uh, before July 15th. Starting it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, do you need to wait for the testing? Testing of what? The soil. No, because the, none of the soil is going to leave the site. Okay, what about the soils that get out on the road? Um, the only reason I can think the soil on the road is trucks driving out of the site, tracking it onto the road. Mm -hmm. And again, I will get that message across not only to Heritage, but also to Pulte. Are you going to send them that 10-page memo from Elaine? Uh, I will look that up, and if, if I have it, I will definitely send it to them. Okay, because we're going to ask our staff to follow up on Matter that. In fact, if you would send it to me just in case I don't have it, I will make sure it gets to everybody. Okay. Um, hey, Phil, can we ask you about the newer design? 
Yeah. So, um, so the stormwater management systems for legacy farms were built uh, with some agreement with the um, the nursery itself. To they wanted all the water to uh, for their systems. So the the water quality, the um, all the, the rain gardens were built for treatment only. Um, and when, when the issue became that there was there's ex, extra water getting onto Wilson Street, we looked looked at closely at it, and we we were, we had the uh, design engineer uh, evaluate it for what what the flow was pre. Uh, pre-construction okay. so that we could build the basin big enough to mitigate the, the, the uh, proposed improvements. There's a, there's a small part of Legacy Farms Road North that drains into that ditch and it goes, goes to that basin. So it was sized so that there was no increase pre-construction, uh, post-construction versus pre-construction. So that's why the basin got bigger. Mm -hmm. So there was also an, a discussion about what infiltration rate to use. Uh, the design engineer used a, I forget, <coughs> an a, an, either an A or B soil for their calculation, which means it was a, w they were using a higher infiltration rate. However, we knew from uh, reviewing the site there uh, at at um, at the trails that the, 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 the soil was poor. Uh, yeah. And so we had them design it as a sea soil, which drains very slowly, so. What about the, the specialized bioretention soil? So the soil is meant to grow plants uh, and, and provide uh, nutrients for the plants, but the 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 volume the the issue at this place at, at this location was the volume not necessarily uh, the tr the treat the, the treat the sediment basin there's many ways to design it so um, and she's she was right the the uh, outlet pipe is above so that you can have all the sediment settle and you won't drain all the sediment out the bottom is this water going to stand more than seventy two hours. It's not designed to. Um, who is oversight for, uh, so I think that we're talking like two different things, right? Who is oversight for the pollutants that we have to be careful about, particularly given the reservoir below it? Who's oversight? Yeah, who, 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 has, who has to be satisfied that we're doing the right job um, addressing the pollutants, not necessarily the flow? I actually think the CONCOM has an engineer that does that. And what's this? This is, this is outside the conservation jurisdiction. I think, I think she's talking about the, you're talking about the project, right? I'm talking about the chemicals in the, the soil that bind to the soil that we want to not see trickle down into the reservoir, whatever that. So you want to, however that you want to contain the sediment. That's what the that's what the infiltration basin is for. That's why there's check dams in the swale. It's it's meant to capture as much sediment as possible. Okay. So, Madam Chair, if, yeah. if I may, if, yeah, and I, please help. Maybe I can join these mm -hmm. conversations together. The as far as I know, the contaminant binds to the soil. Yeah. So if the soil doesn't run off the site, there should be no contaminants off site. Yeah. So. I guess it's it's up to the planning board to make sure that because in the SWIP it was said no sediment is to go off the site. Right. So therefore, <coughs> I guess it's in assumed that it's also the planning board's jurisdiction to say no Gieldrin goes off site either as it's part of the soil. If that answers your question. Yes, but did we just hear that if it's contaminated soil, it has to be removed and dealt with? So I believe it was, it could be removed and dealt with or needs to remain on the site. Things that are in far exceedance of certain regulations, I'm not talking about Deldrin. Deldrin can stay on the site. That's not the issue. It's, it's other things if you have them. Now, we've done extensive testing, and there's nothing presently. I'll give you an example, like up with the... Um, 
the where the storage warehouses are. Yeah. We had fuel tanks. We took out. This is many years ago. We took out the fuel tanks. There was some contaminated soil, small areas, but contaminated soils. Those had to be put in barrels, and I think went to New Jersey or someplace. I forget where it went. So there's that type of soil. There's other soils. There's there's a litany of different things. Sometimes they go to land landfill. Sometimes they go to unland landfill. In this instance, I think you, John, you're absolutely correct. In this type of soil, it's basically keeping it on site. The majority of the soil has no contaminant in it, but there are places that has potentially some deldrin. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Um, so we know that the soil testing is going to be done by July 15th, and we're going to get the, the results. Correct. How long do the results take? They're going to have to go on immediately because it usually takes about a week to get the results back once you've done the testing. So they need to get on it this week. Right. So then by the 22nd, our meeting on the 22nd, we could see those results. I can't say that. I thought we said the 15th. For the testing? Yes. But what results are you referring to? The, the results of that testing. Again, I, I don't want to speak for all the people. I'm going to tell them first thing in the morning you've got... Are, are you saying the 22nd of July? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. I think we're already past yeah, the we're 22nd. We're past the 22nd. You're right. You're right. No, that's that's <laughs> that re that's that's reasonable. Oh, thank you. Yes. Can I uh, entertain a motion to open and continue the public hearing um, on 9 B Street, the special permit for lots with historic structures, to be um, continued until the conclusion of this very brief conclusion of discussion? So moved. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you for reminding me. That was my finger up crossed over here, and I still forgot about it. Um, okay. So uh, do your best to get us the soil testing results by the 22nd. How about that? Is that fair? We July have, 22nd? We're going to get it. I'm going to tell him he has to do it. Okay. Um, okay. Really quickly, um, I'm going to have Katie come back, and then we're going to move on to our next one. Thank you very much. I just wanted to know if you had any final thoughts, Katie. Two minutes to wrap up. Um, so just the results of this testing you're going to do does not change anything on this site. The site is, is all of the soil that's there is um, assumed, presumed to be contaminated with this persistent deodorant and that's not, nothing is going to change that. and. The, the main thing to um, focus on is that the containment of the runoff to date has not been very good. Okay. Okay. So yeah. the, it's been years. We've been talking about this for years <laughs> in terms of the, um, the stream that formed because they cut down all the trees and clear cut the, you know, and the stream that formed and flowed out onto Wilson Street. Um, you can see the, the rock bed there. Um, you know, since we've been talking about this, they haven't not cut it again, but they can. There right. is no, there is nothing to prevent them from clear cutting that area again, and there is no um, zoning to protect, you know, that. So um, the the thing to focus on is that the. The, the, the structures need to improve. The, the stormwater structures for this parcel need to be better. Yeah. And promises, promises. Um, I, I, I think you should be very skeptical of the promises. The, the last design, the only design we have that's credible is this one where the bioretention soil was there. Um, and yes, it is expensive, but um, the, 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 the idea of the plants growing is that also gets rid of a lot of the water because the plants, you know, s some of the water goes through the sandy mix and then the plants also take some of the water out into the air. So it's a, um, it, that's all part of the design. And it was designed by, it was designed in this process. That, that is the design that came out of this process. Okay, I, this, I understand. This backdoor change that occurred um, was 
was um, not an engineering process. It was, it was like I say, I, I got the information request for that. I got all the emails. It was a, a it was. I, rem I remember, we remember, we saw it. So I am gonna take the action item to follow up on the design between now and the ne when we hear the results. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Just to build on to Ms. Towner's point. Um, I sent you an email earlier, earlier yes. today, and that sent to the rest of the board, but I'd like to yes, bring please. that up. Yep. Uh, so I went on site with Bob Lamoureux, who is uh, also with Beta, to the North Northwest Villages portion, um, because there was some turbid flow coming off site from there. And we walked the site, it was very muddy, did not bring my boots, um, I learned, I learned a very hard lesson. Um, but Phil and I were just talking beforehand, and I think uh, we're gonna set up a meeting with the contractor and Pulte and Beta to go over some stormwater management redesigns to get this uh, under wraps because there is um, a lot of fine sediment coming off the site right. even after the big rainstorm. So that is really good news. Um, and I would, um, I would encourage that process to be really transparent and public because this is an issue of some um, specific concern, particularly because it's a drinking water source for Ashland, right? The, the reservoir. Maybe yes, too. Okay. Does it come back clear. to us? Sorry. Yes. Can I finish your question? Yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, just, you said the northwest. I'm just trying to visualize it. Is that the western side of the Legacy yes. Farms North? Yes. Okay. Have okay. they started okay. building there or? They're not building. Um, they're doing site prep, I think. They, they're moving dirt around. I don't know what they're actually doing. Maybe so doing they're doing some utilities, mm -hmm. and, uh, doing the utility work. And then they're gonna they're gonna they get ready to, to make the road, okay. and because they made the they, they cut the road for um, so they cut the road for the uh, the, the soil to, to the road, it acted as a conduit, and we had that you know very large rainstorm, quick rainstorm for uh, the entire spring. Thursday? Was it <laughs> yeah, Thursday? It was last week, Wednesday. Yeah, or Thursday. yeah, yeah. So and it just funneled it all the way down to. Um, Legacy Farms Road North and done down toward the Franklin r Road and out that way. So it wasn't going to to the to the reservoir. It wasn't staying on site for sure. Right, right. It's right. Just, just a quick follow up so I'm clear. So Katie and Ray, Ray, what we talked about earlier is like up in the northeast section, right? right. This is yes. more kind of like the two south separate. west because it's flowing down. Yeah, two okay. separate things. Yep, I just you. wanted to bring it up. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Beta, Beta sent us the uh, report. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll want to stay up to speed on what's going on with that. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're probably going to do the same thing we did uh, at, at uh, like, uh, <coughs> Trails. Just make sure everyone, the contractor, the site contractor, the owner, uh, uh, John Westling, you know, Don. What's the, what's the expected time on that? we got to do it as soon as we can this week. Yeah, we haven't set a time. Yet. Okay, so keep just keep us posted, um, and we meet again on the 9th. It would be great to hear about it. Or the eighth. We mean, yeah, the eighth. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All righty. I will uh, entertain a motion to uh, reopen or yeah reopen the public hearing for nine B Street. So moved. Second. So, all those in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Maybe Welcome. Right there is good. Can I get one in for that? Thank yeah. You. That's where it's well, been working for others. So thank you. For the TV camera. We'll get it. My name is George Connors. I'm an attorney. Hold on one second. I'll let you set up, and we have we have a member that's uh, going to be right back. I'm going to be right back. Yep, we have two members that are going to be right back. We're going to pause briefly. Okay, three. Four. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Talk about this right now, but just to, uh, at some point. I would like to talk. So we are on TV. Right. No, okay. this is fine. I just yep. want to give you a heads up yes. so that I'm not catching you at the end. Yep. Um, just to talk about the appointments that the planning board needs to make soon. Yes. So I can like bring it up to everybody. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so that's Trails Design Review Board and Growth Study. Um, okay. And then I can That's also, not here, right? It's not. No, okay. I'm not doing that. I just want to let everyone yes. know okay. that we have to do that thank soon. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then if you would also like, I could give an update on the Legacy Farms North Trails, the Trails uh, amendments that they're... Legacy Farm North... I don't have... The, sorry, the Trails. Trails. 
It's not on the agenda either. Okay. We had a meeting with them earlier. I don't have to, but it's okay. Thank you, though. Just yep. Updates. Yep. More for information on the board. I have to get some of those NASA special NASA diapers so people can <laughs> make it all the way. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. We can't even do minutes. <laughs> and we also have the Haynes Farm. Request. You're a natural born leader. <laughs> a couple, couple hot days, people have been hydrating. <laughs> I've been hydrating too. You guys. <laughs> Thanks. I just, still need one. Reinforcement. I appreciate it. Don't think I don't. I think we need one more person anyway because for a minute, we can't even do minutes, right? Right there, five. Um, there's no members. Good, good. good. The, oh, well, no, we can no, definitely no. do them. Oh. In the meantime. No, so while we're, we're waiting for Deb, can we uh, entertain a motion on the minutes? May 2nd, May 13th, and May 29th. So moved. Second. Uh, any comments, any changes? Um, on May 13th, there was one comment at the end um, that uh, when Fran was leaving, and it was a her versus him. It should be him. Just thinking. So. Um, OK, all those in favor of approving the minutes with that minor change? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Awesome. Thank you. Um, do we have to, is the bond release something we have to do tonight? It's not something we have to do, no. Okay. Waiting for Deb, waiting for Deb. Um, I think we're just waiting. Oh, here we go. Yes, thank you for your patience. Go ahead and introduce yourself and your project, or your, yes. Project. My name is George Connors. I'm an attorney representing Newbridge Investments. With me is Scott Miller. He's uh, the managing partner of Newbridge. We have a, Mr. Uh, Miller has a project at um, 9B Street. There's an existing old uh, house and a garage. This is B Street here, and that's C Street up there. That's Route 85. And Walcott Street over here. So it's a small parcel in this area, and it contains about uh, 27,955 square feet, and it has um, 132 feet of frontage, two 66-foot lots. There was a line that connected that point, uh, bisecting the front uh, area here, and it has been uh, merged for zoning purposes for some time now. Originally, there was a house built, uh, according to the assessor's cards, sometime before 1900. Uh, probably even before that, there was some uh, mapping, historic mapping that showed uh, two structures on that land, but uh, in 1900, there was a single one. The zoning district is the RA requiring 15,000 square feet and 100 feet of frontage per lot. I'm gonna change maps. So what Newbridge, New, uh, Newbridge is in, uh, proposing to do is to um, use the uh, zoning bylaw for lots with historic structures, section 210.117.2. And we believe that that would give us the ability to create a lot for this historic structure. The front portion is the historic structure from 1900. There's some additions in the back. Mr. Miller will go through some of the building particulars. <coughs> but there's then the garage over here, and we would create a conforming lot with 100 feet of frontage and 15,000 square feet. And then under the lots with historic structures, we would have a lot that had 32 feet of frontage and uh, just under uh, 15,000 square feet. The building, can you pass that out or put it up? The building is uh, got that typical gable end facing the street. Um, the neighborhood has several buildings like that. There are also some built in other areas of the town, particularly as you go up Hayden Row and in those areas. The um, 
historic commission has looked at this particular project for two reasons. One was to uh, issue a demolition permit, which they did, and the other is to um, look at it as a historic structure worthy of preservation. And under the general, uh, under the zoning bylaw, you have a definition for that where it's 75 years or more old, it's <coughs> a little bit more than that. And it uh, has a period or style of architecture that uh, we would wish to keep or propagate. Um, so what we are proposing to do is to create that house with a little bit better materials in the front. Uh, it would have to be moved over into this location on the site. And there is a proposed schematic for where that house would be and where a house that's very similar to it would be. So the historic commission under that uh, concept where we would replicate that frontage and facade and to the extent necessary with better materials modern day and create the same type of structure on the conforming lot, uh, they issued a letter of uh, support for that. Um, we believe that it is a historic structure. There's several pictures of lots in the package that we submitted. Um, and I think that uh, it's in harmony with the neighborhood, in harmony with the area. There are many lots in there that are less than 8,000 square feet um, and have varying frontages, fairly small. The master plan suggests that uh, there should be gable ends oriented to the street and the defining modern uh, one and a half story um, dwelling type layouts for that particular era. There has been stuff in the master plan about um, the particular buildings uh, being uh, required or encouraged to be uh, saved in certain areas that make it uh, um, complementary to the town. There are three or four or five sections in the master plan that said uh, things of the gable ends oriented, the street were important, uh, worthy of encouragement and preservation. Um, the location we believe is appropriate. As I had indicated earlier on the map on the reverse side, there are numerous small lots and houses in that area. We don't think this would be the least bit incongruous. Um, it certainly wouldn't have uh, any issue with the adjoining zoning districts. Below that, on the bottom of the plan, is a business district. The DPW has issued a letter about the um, uh, street and the services, they say that's okay. Board of Health had no comments. Um, and we don't believe that another additional house would cause any traffic congestion. I'm gonna have Mr. Miller talk a little bit about the building itself and some of the uh, things that he knows a lot more about than I may. Uh, hold on one second, just from a process standpoint, when is a decision due on this? Yeah, 90 days, so it's a special permit, so oh. it doesn't have like an a &R requirement. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Okay. Yes. Good evening. I'm Scott Miller with Newbridge Investments, and uh, we purchased 9 B Street in January of this year, and uh, we're trying to determine our options of what to do with the property. The existing home, you can see in the pictures, uh, the front portion of the structure is historic, and then there were some additions done probably in the 60s or 70s, which are in significant dire need of repair or replacement. Um, there's mold in the house, the roof leaks. It's, it's been in serious disrepair for probably a long time. Um, it is a conforming lot. It has 132 feet of frontage and 27,000 square feet. Uh, there's, as George mentioned, an existing oversized two-car garage in the house. <coughs> um, rather than exploring our options, rather than just come in as a developer and propose to tear it down and basically build whatever we want, uh, we didn't feel that would be in keeping with the neighborhood. So the board and any abutters that are here this evening has a back deck. should know that rather than just propose to tear the house down and build oh, a big house with a big garage and, and look <coughs> out of character with the neighborhood, we went to Historic Commission and discussed some options with them on the property. And we came up with a plan to preserve the historic front portion of the house. And they were uh, encouraging to use the zoning bylaw to attempt to get a special permit to preserve that house and put it on a non-conforming lot. 
Um, we even went so far as to agree with the story that on the conforming lot that we're proposing to create, to also build a structure that will be in keeping with the gable-facing homes of the neighborhood, and something that would be less detrimental to the neighborhood as opposed to building some big new colonial on the conforming lot. Uh, we feel that there's a need in the town to create smaller housing, uh, more affordable. Uh, this is a walk to town location, uh, so I think this would be something attractive uh, and something that's not really readily available in town right now. When you say more affordable, what is that? What's your window? And you're looking well, rather at than tear down something, you I know. a million dollar house, uh, try to build two smaller houses that are uh, you know, more affordable in comparison to something that would would uh, be higher priced if there were just one house there. So in order to achieve that, uh, the economics would be to create the two separate lots and, and build something that's smaller and more in keeping architecturally with the neighborhood. Um, so we went into historic and got that approval and support, and I believe that letter is in mm -hmm. the package. Yeah. Yes. So can you just explain the rationale about the front edge for the two? Because to me, it looks a little, I mean, you have a 100 foot front edge and then a 32 front foot front edge. Maybe are you just trying to establish one standard, uh, one that conforms? Or to me, it almost would seem a little more rationale to have two 66 foot front edges. It's, uh, I would say it's the law of unintended consequences that probably the area of Walcott, A, B, and C should be a village district, 50 by 100, so that existing homeowners that want to do an addition or want to add a porch or whatever don't have to constantly go in and get a variance. So, yeah, that would be great. But unfortunately, when they change the zoning and just put an overlay of RA over the Walcott, A, B, and C area, you're forced with 100 foot of frontage and 15,000 square foot land area. So let me ask my question a little differently. So could you have made a 66 foot and a 66 foot frontage? No, no, no. Um, we're, we have the ability under the bylaw to create a lot which does not meet the size and setback okay. for the uh, house, to, the historic house. The other lot, even though it's not going to be a historic house, okay. would conform. So it's kind of our zoning that has put you in that situation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'd, we'd, prefer, we'd prefer to do 266 foot oh, right. lots, but that's zoning variance and what's the hardship we bought, you know. All right, thank you. Okay. I'm going to go to John. Sure. So you want me to go over? Yep. My memo? Yep. All right. Um, <clears throat> So the property uh, is being applied for under the historic special permit or historic site with special permit, which allows the uh, waiver of lot size and setback requirements by the planning board under a special permit. Um, I won't go over all the details that they just explained. They, they explained it pretty well. Uh, so going point by point through section 210.117.2, lots with historic structures, um, my comments are that as part of the uh, initial A portion, the non-conforming lot does not provide the required frontage or frontage depth. Um, and both of these are not generally classified as lot size or setback requirements. So in my interpretation, the planning board does not have the authority to waive the frontage of the lot. Or, or frontage depth. Or frontage depth. And so frontage depth is defined in the zoning bylaw <clears throat> as 60% of the lot frontage must have the following minimum depth measured at 90 degree angle from the front lot line. For residence A, it's 90 uh, feet. So basically at 90 feet, the lot width needs to be 60 feet. Yep. At 90 feet into the lot, the width needs to be 60 feet. Yep. Um, and then continuing. Uh, for, for all the other standards, I believe they conform. It's that one that's the concern. So for 117.2A1, uh, the H Hopkinton Historical Commission has confirmed the existing house is a historic structure. Um, and the non-conforming lot 
will contain that historic structure. Mm -hmm. The conforming lot will not. So uh, what they had said before, Dave, to your question, um, they can't do 266 frontages because then they would need a variance for that non-conforming lot um, because that's uh, th that also would not be waivable by the planning board. Um, the proposed general use being single family <clears throat> is accepted is generally accepted as being in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the chapter but I defer to the planning board to make that decision mm -hmm. uh, and the proponent has provided no statement contrary to 117.2b so that's acceptable um, and 117.2c uh, was undertaken by the planning board so, or by Kobe and I so that's all set Okay, and we have a letter from the Zoning Enforcement Officer. Correct. That seems to strongly state that, or, or reinforce, um, that we don't have the authority to. So the uh, building inspector, the Zoning Enforcement Officer, has made an assertion that once lots are merged, they cannot, he is unaware right, right, of right, right. a provision that allows lots to become unmerged. Um, we discussed this. I don't, Mike is not here. Um, I, I don't generally agree with that argument um, because they're providing an A&R plan, which is the route that the planning board can unmerge lots. They're not saying that these are two separate lots. They're saying that they're merged by zoning, so they're technically one lot, and they're just providing an A&R AR plan to divide those lots. Um, but the building department has said that if uh, the planning board does grant a special permit to approve this, they will deny it. Um, to then go to the Board of Appeals to adjudicate this. But when were these originally merged? Like many years ago? Or Pardon me? When, when were they originally when they merged? 65 when they changed the zoning. Okay. Well, seven years after that. Right. Um, okay. Once they're merged, and the issue here is frontage 100 feet, the two lots have 132 feet of frontage combined as a merged entity. Once merger occurs, then the lots are looked at as a single lot of 27,955 square feet with 132 feet of frontage. And um, we can, if it had, if it went back several acres and we laid out a road to go in there or something like that, merger is, once it occurs, it doesn't let you do anything less zoning restrictive. You can then apply for a single family house and have a non, not to be considered building lot on the left, and then go through this process here to get that approved. So I've had conversations with the building inspector and I've drafted a memo to him. Um, he is not gonna agree with me. I think uh, you and I are on the same page though. Okay, so you have drafted a memo back to the building inspector? I have. Have we seen that? No, you have not. Can we see that? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll have you give it to John and he'll put it in the record for the next time. Um, so as a practical matter, if, um, if you're going to have to go to the Board of Appeals anyway, mm -hmm. should you go to the Board of Appeals first? We'd need something for the building inspector to deny in this particular instance. Okay. Therefore, we would have to file a building permit based on a lot that is uh, argumentatively approved and then he will say no building permit and we'll ask the zoning board to overturn that. What about the, uh, the fact that we don't apparently have the authority to waive the frontage or frontage depth? That, that's a great question. I, I looked at that very early on and I read it said that a lot may be created which does not meet size and setback requirements. So once we get that concept then all the sizing and dimensional uh, portions of this, the rectangular box that has to go in, I think <coughs> are subsumed. If you assume on the other side of that, then you can't create lots for the historic structures that don't meet size and setback requirements. The bylaw can't be used at all. The bylaw can't be used at all if you don't waive, simply waive lot size and setbacks? If a lot may be created which does not meet size and setback requirements, then there's no purpose for the bylaw. You can't do anything. You'd have to have conforming lots. Can I clarify? 
Right. Yes. So it sounds like just the word frontage is missing from the bylaw, that we can't waive frontage, but we could waive the lot size and setback. That's what we're understanding. Right. Okay. And, I, right. think, I don't part of the lot size, the frontage. Isn't that how right, it's I don't know. <laughs> so lots well, of one of those questions may I, that lawyers may I answer, answer that in a with a corollary argument. You approve cluster subdivisions all the time with less of frontage. So yeah, we're going to just talk about this one, sure. and we're not going to talk about all the other things that might happen somewhere else under some other circumstances. But we're just going to talk about this one and the information that we're getting. Maybe. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say maybe Zach should look at this. Maybe that we should have the bylaw have inserted the word frontage. I don't. We might, we can certainly ask Zach to look at it. Yeah. John has a phone. Hold on one second. Through the chair, I, I thought when, in your opening remarks, I thought at one point you said the historic commission gave you approval to tear it down, yes. but then you also said the historic commission deemed it a historically significant structure. The uh, zone, the zoning. There was an article on town meeting to uh, increase the time period that the zoning uh, that the um, historical commission could look at a teardown project. And we went into them prior to that uh, to see if we could get a decision under the old bylaw, which was a shorter time frame. So we can tear the house down now. We don't intend to, we don't want to, we'd rather do this. But then also in your opening remarks, <coughs> I heard about the disrepair of the house. Yes. And so, is it going to be the same house? Is it going to be a historically significant house if it's in such disrepair? In our pre well, you can. Yes, you yeah. Well, so what we've agreed to do is repair uh, what what is necessary. So obviously, if a roof is falling in, we're going to fix that portion of it so that someone it's habitable. You know, so if we pull a building permit, we're going to be inspected, and it's got to be habitable. Uh, windows have to be functioning. Doors have to be functioning. Uh, if siding is falling off the house or there's trim boards on the, uh, on the roof and the siding are completely rotten, we'll repair that. What we agreed with architectural, uh, not architectural, historical, is that the architectural will be completely replicated. So the building as it stands may have some newer products on it, but it will look exactly like it does now. Okay, we, in the interest of time, we're going to have to... Um Pick a time for our next meeting, but I want to make sure I uh, hear from members of the public that wanted to speak. Could I clarify a little bit on the yeah. historical process? So usually, it sounds like this is what happened in this case, that they approved the demolition because they agreed with the plan that you presented, right? Normally they wouldn't have. No, 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 we, we um, fast-tracked our demolition in case the bylaw of the town changed. Okay. So we can tear it down. So it's been more than six months, you're saying? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay we're, I'm just going to ask you to make space for um, public comment. And then we, I know we have another uh, topic to get to at 9.30, so we're pushing our time limit here. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Madam Chairman. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Know. You, you know what the deal is is that even if we can hear you, we have to have the public at home be able to hear you. So introduce yourself and then go sure. ahead. Um, good evening, Madam Chairman. My name is Drew Hoyt. I'm an attorney. I represent Brian Hunt to my right. Um, Brian Hunt owns and lives at Five B Street. Okay. The immediately adjacent property. Okay. Thank you. I brought some photographs that I can provide. You can just pass them. We'll pass them for you. Thanks. Um, these photographs, the upper left, photograph shows um, on the left side of the photograph you can sort of see the end of Mr. Hunt's house yep. and the side yard and then through the tree line um, the roof of the, the red house that's yep. being discussed. Um, Mr. Hunt's concern, his practical concern is that um, given the narrowness of the frontage that's proposed for the historic lot um, that then opens up in the back and the, the, the 
historic houses proposed to be relocated quite far back on the lot yeah um, and very close to mr. Hunt's property line so in the upper left photograph you see um, sort of in the center top a big cluster of you know quite large and old and very nice um, walnut trees yep those would be gone I certain they would be gone because they would be otherwise overhanging the house if not on top of it <coughs> um, instead there would be something there a house a house um, would be there with as shown on the sketch um, an addition shown as garage um, but no real rendering of exactly what the whole structure would look like when they were done constructing it so that's a question that we have exactly what yep. Brian would be looking at Mr. Hunt would be looking at um, out his backyard. This would be basically right out his back window to the right. So that's his sort of most immediate practical concern. Um, Mr. Hunt supports, um, strongly supports, um, an effort to save that red house. Yep. Um, he enjoys living next to it um, and wants to work with the proponent to, um, to be able to make that happen. Um, what Mr. Hunt's concern is, is the location, um, first and foremost. And what Mr. Hunt would like to do, as the owner of the adjacent property that has a surplus of frontage, um, is to um, discuss with the developer um, some sort of um, land swap or something whereby the developer can obtain additional frontage. Um, from Mr. Hunt and then therefore be able to move the house closer to the front of the street consistent with the neighborhood and that's what the other photographs here show the houses here are that village style up close to the street which is where Mr. Hunt thinks the red house should stay up close to the street in that okay, village style. Okay, so I'm going to just stop you right there. Um, we have no objection to you doing whatever it is you need or want to do um, but that isn't um, something that we are going to decide and certainly not tonight. Understood. I guess my point, uh, my the second half of that point, is that um, in addition to his practical concern, Mr. Hunt does have his own legal objections to the um, to the project that's proposed and would be opposing it in its in its current form. But would like to, assuming there's a continuance, work with the developer and have those concerns addressed outside rather than have to voice them here. I think we can probably work them out with the proponent. Okay. So just. Um for purposes of process, Mr. Hunt, this is the opening of the public hearing. It's not going to be closed tonight. In fact, we're going to wrap up pretty soon and continue it. Um, at every public hearing, we continue to a date and time place certain so that if you're in attendance and you're following it, you'll know when the hearings are going to be. Um, and um, we haven't even talked about the, the outline, but we will have an opportunity. You saw that in the meeting materials, I'm sure your attorney would have seen them. We will have an opportunity to add items to the outline that are the planning board's purview. Um, and in the meantime, you are certainly uh, welcome to work with your attorney on any discussions you wanted to entertain with um, the developer. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Catino. as a member of ZAC. Um, I just wanted to implore the board to take up Amy's um, request to send to ZAC that village concept. It, we did it about three years ago, I think, that um, we want to do an overlay so that, I believe right now about 80, 78 to 83% or something to that range of the lots in that village area are non-conforming. And what we wanted to do is in that area to just bring the <laughs> lot sizes down so that uh, the uh, planning board and, and zoning board of appeals doesn't have to do special permits for everybody that wants to just put a new stairway or put a deck or change something on their home. Yeah. It, it failed the town meeting. I just think that we may have sold it wrong and people didn't understand what we were trying to do. But if, if you guys could send that down to Zach for us okay. to look at again, it would be a great thing. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, um, when is our next opportunity to speak on this? So how long will you have the growth study interviews take? 
Uh, oh, it's blocked out. It starts at uh, nine. So yeah. if we block it out I think for we're going to leave that alone, uh, just in case. So it looks like um, July 22nd, we could start at seven again. <laughs> um, we have a half hour. We could have a half hour for 76 Main Street. Right now, there's an hour for that. So it's 7.30, then 8.30. Um, okay. And then the next, so let me just say it this way. July 22nd, we have one at 7.30, one at 8.30, and one at 9 o'clock. 7.30, 8.30. Nine. What's at nine? Uh, the L and G line replacement. All right. How about we put this one at nine thirty? Um, I'll entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to July twenty second at nine thirty. So moved. Moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, and now we have um, a discussion with REC Hopkinton and um, our friends on the Affordable Housing Task Force. So we might, um, Beth is still here. Yeah, come on up. And do we need another chair, do you think? Or Beth, do you wanna just sit on the end here? All right, and then we're, then we're there. Thanks for your patience. Welcome. Go ahead and introduce yourselves because somebody's new to us. <laughs> Kathy Sherry, REC Hopkinton. I'm here representing uh, Paul Mastriani. And we have Liz Rust from the Regional Housing Services Office who is an affordable housing consultant that we've hired. So sorry I introduced you. That's okay. That's exactly who I am. <laughs> yep, Liz Rust. Thank you. <laughs> and we also have uh, Beth Malloy, I recently became chair of the Affordable Housing Fund Committee, uh, 190 Lumber Street, Hopkinton. Okay, Affordable Housing Task Force? Trust Fund. Trust Fund. Affordable trust Housing fund. Trust Fund. Okay, perfect, thank you. <clears throat> Wanted to do a brief, just recap. Just recap. I know we've got yeah. some new members here. Yeah, and, and um, we did have a conversation um, with Beth. Um, and uh, Paul and you folks and John. Um, so as you all know who have been on the board carrying forward, we imposed a slightly different um, requirement that is allowed in our bylaws for them to construct and deliver the, the actual affordable units. And here we are. So just as a reminder, this is the Chamberlain Wayland subdivision. We have 32 um, residential units which require us to deliver three affordable units. Our special permit was issued last April of 2018 and it was agreed that we would deliver three off-site units. Within that special permit, it you know, defined the conditions and criteria, one of which was the schedule that, by which we would develop, that we would deliver the units in conjunction with our certificates of occupancy. So we did, as um, Muriel had mentioned, we did have kind of an informal preliminary meeting just to start to understand what is this process. We're kind of the guinea pigs here. <laughs> um, so I think there's going to be some time and effort between the two just to kind of work out what the process is. We've hired Liz to help us through this. She's very experienced. And she's been great at kind of teaching us or um, giving us knowledge on what the process was, what the timeline is, what our responsibility as developer is, what the town's responsibility is, et cetera. So um, in that preliminary meeting, we, I think we had a better understanding of what we needed to do in the timeline. And in addition to that, we had a number of kind of follow-up or discussion items that we thought might be appropriate to bring here. So I think our, our, from our perspective, if I jump into this mural, if that's okay, our concern is a little bit about the timeline and, and how that works with our development timeline. Right now, um, within our special permit, the first unit is to be delivered um, basically after we build 10 houses. So before the certificate of occupancy is issued on the 11th unit. And then the second one is on the 21st unit and then the last one is on the 31st unit. Looking at the current time frames, just getting the program approved, getting the individual unit approved with the state, we're talking anywhere from six to 12 months um, as a timeline to get that through the approval process, get an actual lottery buyer, everything and close. So with that, we're a little concerned about um, how that works with our development time frame. And I think we, we'd like to see if there's some flexibility on the planning board side um, about potentially moving that and giving us a little bit more leeway as far as delivering that first unit potentially at the 20th unit. That would give us enough time to work out the process 
as well as the ongoing oversight that's required by the town. I think the other point we want to discuss is given the low inventory of homes, um, especially kind of at that affordable price range, what will be maintainable ongoing, and um, how quickly the market turns over, that part of our condition is that the planning board has to approve the unit. So we'd like to understand what that approval process would be. We fully intend to basically find the unit, inspect, and close within 30 days. So, and we, then we want to get the unit off to the state for approval. So we're going to need to understand how we work with the planning board and how that can be expedited and what the criteria is there. Um, so I think that's probably the, the highlight from our perspective, what we're looking for, some direction and answers. Perfect. And just, um, just to, in full disclosure to the public and, and to the board members and so forth, um, we did talk in terms of, um, of you know, hoping that we could be flexible within this process um, with our first person through the process because they are obviously helping us actually construct and develop the process that we're going to use going forward. Um, I did ask John to research exactly what we need to do um, if we're going to entertain that in terms of the special permit. So <clears throat> the things that we uh, talked about was what Kathy said. Where, how is it defined, the schedule itself? Um, and it is defined in the special permit as a condition. So it provides the schedule, like Kathy said, 11th unit, certificate of occupancy mm -hmm. is when the first unit needs to be provided. And just for the public and for everybody, that's when the payments happen if we have the payments in lieu of. Mm -hmm. So I think to remedy that, you would just need a minor amendment to change that condition. That would just be changing it to either having the two units delivered at the 21st certificate mm -hmm. of occupancy or the two first unit in. at the 20th and the second unit at the mm -hmm. 21st or however you want to uh, organize that. Okay. And then the other one was um, approving the unit. Right. So I looked into that a little bit more and um, it's the location of the units, which I think is a little bit different than what we had talked about. Okay. So when I was thinking about the approval of the units, it was, and I think this is how maybe I was explaining it, is the planning board has to approve like the design of the unit. Mm -hmm. It was really just the location, location. of the unit. Okay. So I don't know if the planning board is amenable to, when you guys identify it, bring it to the planning board, mm -hmm. and then we can talk about it as a non-hearing item, and then the planning board can just or I, I would toss up for consideration um, because of the pace of the housing market, allowing professional staff potentially to do that approving. Um, I don't know. I, I put that out there for Thank people you. to consider. So maybe I could just um, yes. provide a little overview of the state's involvement with the process. So these are going through what they call the LIP program, Local Initiative Program. And the state would be doing a three-part approval at different times. One is the approval of the Chamberlain, Whalen off-site units, right? So that would be the program level. And then each individual address and specific property would be given to the state for approval with the lead inspection and the home inspection for them to approve that unit to be added to the program. And then they approve the actual buyer. So they do a very thorough vetting in addition to whatever local process you have here. Perfect, thank you. So if I may, I'm yeah. sure. the, I think the determination of the location of the unit is really so that if it's in a historic district, all of the processes are followed through on. Um, you're not making a, uh, an area of town where all of the affordable units are just kind of being sequestered. That, it's that kind of overview, not necessarily, oh, is this the right place for it when there's these amenities versus over here? You know, mm -hmm. It's more of like making sure it's spread out through town and making sure that there's no historic structures that are not being looked at. Okay. Adam Chair, may yes. I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Why would we move the three affordable units off-site? Why, do they have why to did we? No, why would they have to be off-site? So um, I'll answer the question here. The answer, the easy answer is they don't have to be moved off-site. A piece of the learning that we did <laughs> with Chamber, Chamberlain and Whalen um, is that if we are going to, going forward, if we are going to contemplate requiring the units um, on the plan, um, that really has to come at the beginning because that impacts the number of units and the way that they uh, present their plan in its entirety. 
So that's a piece of learning that we did on Chamberlain and Whalen. So it, it is something to keep in mind going forward if we are going to want want units in a particular location, you know, in, within a development like this. Um, we need to broach that subject early in the process. And should we, we had three choices, and at the time we chose this one. We could have requested um, funds in lieu, a payment in yep. lieu. We could have yep. requested on site, and we could have requested the off site, which is so. Well, we, at the end of the process, we really couldn't have asked for the, the units on site. I mean. But we had discussed it along the way a little bit, right? A little bit, yeah. right? But if we are going to, if we're going to be serious about that, if it's something, we should probably add it to our agendas. Um, the um, the uh, the outline hearing outlines, um, it should be up front if we're going to do it because it's part and parcel of the overall planning. Just to be clear, yeah. if I might, isn't the choice up to the applicant? No, it's the planning board's purview. Now we heard the attorney at town meeting say differently for the property on um, in the Osmo. So, but within our bylaws, it's within our purview. Yes. I'd like to also add that when we did talk about it, Amy, um, they did offer us three houses um, on site, well, in, in the development that would have been on smaller lots, smaller homes, and I think what the Affordable Housing Fund Committee is going for right now is let's get the houses out in the neighborhood. We didn't want them to be identified as the affordable housing units. So I don't think it was ever offered that we would put them into this. This no, number. not for our particular. We had a brief discussion saying we would have changed our site plan and gone yes, up to right. at least thirty-five yes. units. Yes, in that that particular option we understood we, or, yeah, when we, we broached the subject in detail was not really going to be possible here. Right. It is possible going forward, and everything you just said is something the planning board needs to be mindful of. We don't want. Um, the units to be identifiable as the affordable units. Right. And, and I can, if I can speak for, for my committee, I'd like to say that we would like to see more of the houses sprinkled throughout our neighborhoods um, and incorporate them into the neighborhood so they're not sequestered into the condos and different areas of town. So that's where we're moving as a committee moving forward and hoping you guys have our back. Yeah, so I, I, I don't I, I expect that there'd be any pushback on that, but it will help us as you guys get, I'm, I'm very excited that you're getting up and running. Um, as you get up and running and you have direction for the planning board, make sure um, you've, you put it forward so that we have the opportunity to, to um, work within it and also hopefully um, have your back as you're possible. Up to the chair? Yes. Uh, John made a comment earlier. Does the state monitor where you're putting the affordable housing so like you don't get that cluster? No. They don't? Okay. Unfortunately, no. Um, and a, a lot of the work going forward, they don't, right? Did I just answer? Uh, well, I think it depends on the program. Certainly in the 40B program, the, um, the, the individual site locations of the affordable units are very regulated and reviewed. There, there's more leeway in, um, in um, local, yeah. local special permits. Okay. And then even with the off-site units, there's complete leeway. Part of what we might uh, endeavor to do is um, is take advantage of the learning that we can do on this too, and really get a little bit more fluent on uh, what the possibilities are and what the regulations are and what our responsibility is within it. Yeah. To the chair, so you're uh, obviously coming tonight to ask for some scheduling relief. Like, do you ha do you have a schedule, like a project schedule? Like, is there something you could provide that says? this is what we see the schedule to deliver that unit like if, if it's agreed upon to have an affordable housing unit by the 10th developed well to just extend the date i i have no information to say that's so a good thing to do just from a process perspective that would be an amendment to the um the special permit so yeah. it'll it'll come before us as a minor change and we would have a timeline and dates um to impact correct Yes, we can provide the project schedule and the current build schedule and how that would align with the proposed changes that we're asking for or how it does not align well with the current state approval process and then the whole lottery and buyer selection um, and why we're asking for the relief. And, and one, one follow-up question. Yeah. Is there any either existing dwellings or land that could be 
purchased today for sale in Hopkinton that would fall into affordable housing where it wouldn't be at a significant loss? Well, that's what we will be doing. We're going to those those houses that are on the market now. We're going to be we're looking at those and looking at does it, do we think it'll meet the state criteria? Is the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, is it updated enough, et cetera? Um, and then then we're purchasing them. But have you done any looking today to know if anything's on the market yes, today? There's there's three or four. Three or four that we're Options. looking at. Options. As, as options. Yes. And do you have any uh, knowledge of like what the time on market for something like that is in Hopkinton? Average, like is it five days? Is it 50 days? Is it? I, I don't know specifically across the units. One of the units has been on the market, if that's what you're asking me, for a number of days. The others are new to the market. And we felt before we had this meeting and we, before we really understood the process, we were hesitant to jump on a unit because we can be required to close on the unit before it's been approved. So that's some of the concern about making sure we understand the process. Um, of the houses that are within the price range that we're targeting turn over pretty quickly. The, I've been looking for the last few months and you know things are gone. We didn't jump on them. There's a couple of things still out there and a couple of new things. So Madam Chair, if I may mm -hmm. clarify, I don't know if there's any confusion, but just so the board is on the same page, the proponent is looking to buy a market rate home they go through a process with DHCD to then convert it to a uh, affordable home that's um, sellable, rentable. I guess you're just doing home ownership, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's at a certain area median income. So they basically pay the market rate, then put a deed rider on the house so that they, it's it's um, profit limited. So the person who owns it cannot sell it for market rate. They have to sell it based on a formula. Um, so they're basically paying to then sell it at a lower amount. So they're not, and the, the affordable housing units on the market, there's actually a wait list. So they're pretty in demand. Mm -hmm. Related question to that, do they also do a um, maximum salary for the purchasers? Yeah, the that's, yeah, that's all that's regulated part through part the purchase state. program. Yeah, so, so Liz, uh, Ms. Rust will do the lottery where they select the, the person to purchase it, and then it's a formula based on the area mean income and the housing costs. Yeah. yeah, Amy. I just wanted to add, I agree with Muriel that we need to be able to delegate someone else to act quickly to approve the lot, because whether we designate John or Muriel to, or the chair, I don't know. <laughs> the, the market moves quickly, we understand yeah. that. Yeah. Anybody else have any um, questions? So process-wise for the special permit uh, minor amendment, do we... Um, I don't think it needs to be noticed. If, um, if the board decides. Yeah, if the board decides it's a minor amendment, okay. it's just an amendment to a condition. Um, okay. It doesn't need to be noticed. It can be. You can vote on it now. No, I can't. Um, Maybe it's not on the agenda. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, I guess the minor amendment's not on the agenda. Yeah. The discussion okay. is yeah. on the agenda. Okay. So. Yeah. Maybe. But we could do it next year. Kind of fast track. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate that. Um, but. Um, uh, we could, I mean, I, I certainly feel like that, that um, there is support around, I, mean, I should ask, is there support around the table for these um, minor amendments? Certainly you said, suggested that there was for, um, I would suggest professional staff, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. None of us have um, that kind of flexibility in our schedules. Um, if that works for you, it makes it, sense it, to me. It does, and if I may make a suggestion, yep. saying professional staff and then giving certain criteria so that in the future, there's a precedent for what that decision is based on. So. Yeah, come up with that criteria. Let us yeah, know. I'll, I'll, I can come <laughs> up with that. Basically. You it, know, between it, now and when they come forward with that minor amendment, that would be great. In the same vein of yeah. just making sure that it's not all in one location. Right, right, no, right. 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 Yeah, and particularly exactly. where we are, um, any of those kinds of things where we are establishing, you know, a new process that we hope will be durable and sustainable. I think that's important. Right. And the extension of the timeline, I think we wanted more info before we yes. decide on that. Yes, yes, yes. We're, we're going to all at once. Well, we'll do we need it. the extension of the timeline if it's just the location? We do need the extension of the timeline because of, uh, of their construction okay. timeline. And the, oh, the okay. work so that we're going to lay that out in our amendment request. Yes, but so yes. that you also have comfortable with why we're yeah. So through the chair, though, the point that John made, it's just about the location. Would you still need that extended timeline? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because yes. okay. yeah. the location just has to do with the selection of the unit. Once that we identify the unit, it has to go through, I'll call it the affordable process, probably not the right term, but the whole affordable process. So you have to go yeah. to the state and it could take 6 to 12 months? You exactly. Exactly. Okay. 
Yeah. And there'll be processes that we're setting up in town, too, that are different mm -hmm. and, you know, hopefully durable and sustainable and all those things. Right. And, and ongoing um, the town in conjunction yeah. with and the state. I, is I just want to reiterate, I mean, I am totally open to this idea, particularly because um, of the learning opportunity. We are actually um, utilizing this project and these units to establish a process going forward, and I appreciate that from the developer mm -hmm. a lot. I think it's a, a great concept, but it's kind of interesting because it puts the developer as now a purchaser instead of a seller. Yeah, <laughs> and it keeps us out of the development world, which I think any time we can do that, it's, it, it makes um, the most sense for the town. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, John, you had, if only I could get, find my agenda again. So you're going to have to help me because I tucked it away yeah. somewhere. No, I know Roy loves okay. coming to our meetings, but why is he still there? Um, uh, appointments discussion. Yes, so uh, the fiscal year ends July 30 or June 30th, uh, but then somehow a month later, the appointments usually expire. So the planning board, I believe, oversees the design review board and are now doing the growth study committee. Yes. So I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we need to do that by July 22nd. And the trails committee, the trail coordination and management committee, Dave is currently the person on it. I believe you said you would like to serve again, but sure. the planning board awesome. does have a designee, so you would yep. need to make that designation. Okay, so we could do that right now. Sure. Well, I don't know, it might be hotly contested. I'll entertain a motion <laughs> to have Dave continue with the trails committee. Is it on the agenda though, or can we? Yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't see it. That's a really good question. It's not on the agenda. Nice money. I wrote it because uh, because John asked me about it. So okay. it's That's not okay. on the agenda. Thank you very much. We could vote that quickly yeah. next time. So we'll do it. Yeah, we'll do it. And do, if we can, you know, do it explicitly so we make sure we cover it. And the design review board are, it must be you, yes or no? I, I've done it this year, and Deb has been the alternate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Dave was on it previously. Okay. So I've, I've requested all the design review board members to. Let me know if they're interested in. in oh, we do the whole the whole board every year. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they okay. all serve one year appointments. Thank you. And okay. Actually, it's good that we have a little bit more time so I can get my uh, property signs for my advertisement for running for. <laughs> uh -huh. So I've requested that they. <laughs> yeah. I've requested that they let me know, and then we uh, we posted a notice. So you have to notify or notice for all of these vacancies so that if somebody wants to do it. Perfect. Um, and in that, we've basically kind of copied the growth study committee, 20, 250 uh, word statement just saying why. So okay. I ask them to submit that as well. Oh, you have to write an essay. <laughs> I already did mine. <laughs> nice job. Uh, yes. How many applicants do we have for the growth study committee yet, if any? Uh, None so far. Okay. Just, just me. <laughs> oh yes, one. Yes, yeah. right. But you're, <laughs> there was a little hubbub for a few more. I can I can round that up. I can try to. So, did you uh, apply as a member of the planning board for the planning board spot with an essay? Yeah. Bless your heart. <laughs> She is like she is like the overachiever on the board. I have no. Just uh, cool. Cool. Okay, yeah. awesome. And then uh, I had a question on the growth study committee yes. from somebody who was interested, and they were just wondering what the estimated time commitment. Uh, so that is an excellent question, and uh, the, the they're going to have an opportunity if they apply and get appointed to determine what that time commitment is going to be. We don't really know. That's one of the reasons why we put together that mission statement and, and goal statement and so forth. Um, was to try and give people some way of thinking about it, but I don't know what the time. Well, we gave we 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 came up with a timeline, um, and I would imagine it would meet every other week, um, you know, on a Thursday or, or we don't something, know. But we don't know. We don't know. So, um, but, but the it was, work but is the work is substantial. But the work is substantial yes. that would go into yes. that meeting. Yes. So, yeah, maybe up to two meetings a month. Is that people need I wouldn't to think it's going to be more than two meetings yeah. a month, but it's it's kind of the time. It's not necessarily the time to sit in the meeting. It's, it's the, the work time. that goes into mm -hmm. it. Right. It's the time that. Um, so it, I mean, I don't know. I yeah, there. Are, I've I've heard a little hub of um, um, online about a few people who might, and I can just I can go back to that memo and see if people want to. Uh, um, and in other news, um, I am going to meet um, offline with. Um, the chairman of the board, of the select board, I almost did it. <laughs> wow. I'm going to meet with the chairman of the select board and uh, the chairman of the school committee um, just to have a, a general top level conversation about um, what we hope to do collaboratively going forward. Awesome. Okay. 
Um, okay, and then there was Legacy Farms North Trails. Is that why you're staying? I wasn't sure if you wanted me there for it. Yeah, I, so we actually have to wrap up. That's fine. It was just, a, I just wanted. I would love to speak with you for a few minutes afterwards. But if the planning board wanted me to give just an update as to where that stands, I yes. was happy Can to you do, do it. Yep. So we met with Vin, uh, his engineer, Roy, and um, Peter, uh, Peter Barbieri. Yeah. Um, and they are currently in the process of redoing the site plan. They're going to come into the planning board for a site plan modification based on the reduction of units uh, because they're moving yeah. some, some to uh, payments in lieu. Um, and they're also preparing documents to just outline all the changes needed in the uh, master plan special permit to change it based on the article 40, uh, 36 and 37, or article 37, I guess, really. Okay. Which agenda item is this, sorry? It's to be considered at any time, or uh, the Rafferty Road? Legacy Farms North, yes. It's, it, there's no. No, it's not oh. any kind it's of agenda item. I just wanted to give an update because okay. we just had a oh. meeting recently just to let the board know that it's in the process. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Were there, what, I have a question. Are, are any of these to be considered items something that we should touch real quickly um, so they don't get lost sometime? So um, I'm going to represent that we have to adjourn by 10, but if there is a pressing item, tell me. So I just have a clarity on a couple yes. of those. I just real quick questions. Yep. So um, what's Lumber, so I can take a ride down there, the Rafferty Road, what's the issue with that? Disrepair? Oh, yeah, Ra Farms yeah. Road. It's, it, this winter it took a beating. The road they itself, were the pavement? Or? How, did, how did this come on to here? It was uh, some, I don't remember who, somebody brought it I up. Brought it up. <laughs> was I brought it up and it was in relationship to the construction tab. Uh, traffic for the LNG and we weren't okay, sure. So, so I can just look at the pavement, right? Maybe yeah, it's so. like potholed. All right, and just... Um, Is that something more for the DPW, though? Or? Well, so I think it's, it goes to the broader conversation that we need to have on uh, the fact that we've had a ribbon cutting and people are flying through there, um, but it's not an accepted road. And I don't know how pieces that were previous roads that are now part of Legacy Farms North yeah. are considered... Um, a, and the, the piece of the road that is the brand new piece of the road and an accepted road, and we have all those um, school kids, um, right. that issue going forward there. So I actually think that we need to have a formal agenda item right. to understand how to get that road approved. That, yeah, the whole thing conceptually. So uh, that brings us to mind. What, what's our agenda look like again? One more time around which, the time. On which day? Well, let's look at that. Uh, My eighth? The eighth, just to introduce it. So the eighth has a continued public hearing for Buckland Leonard at seven. Uh, continued public hearing for Whisperway at seven thirty. A new public hearing for Wood Street Solar at eight thirty. Uh, and growth study committee interviews at nine. So let's do it at eight forty-five. Did that? Did I follow you when you that said that? It gives you fifteen minutes for the new public hearing. It's not a new public, oh. It is a new public hearing. The 8.30 is a new public hearing. So uh, back me up, maybe I meant 8.15. Did I mean 8.15? Uh, you could, so. Wait, 7.30 to 7.40, 7.30, yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah. Whisper Way, right Whisper Way is at 7.30. No, I'm gonna talk oh, good, talk yeah. okay. Whisper Way is at 7.30 and the new public hearing is at 8.30. So you have an hour for Whisper Way. Which I think they asked for, if I remember correctly, did they? And we talked about doing an hour. And then a new public hearing is at 8.30. Correct. And then what's next? Nine. Nine is the Growth Study Committee interviews. And, and seven was what? Uh, Buckland Leonard. Buckland Leonard. Oh, help me out, people. All right, what's, what's in August? And are we going to have one meeting for David? So that's August? the 8th. Oh, yeah. That's July 8th. There's also a July 22nd. Oh, go ahead to the 22nd. So July 22nd is 7.30 is a uh, continued public hearing for 76 Main. Yep. 8.30 is a continued public hearing for Maspinock Woods. Yep. And 9 o'clock is a public hearing for the LNG line replacement. And 9.30 is a continued public hearing for 9B Street. All right, so 7.30 to 8.30 is the gap, right, for 76? And 7 to 8, 7.30, if you wanted to start. 7 to 7.30. Do we, do we have something at 7 or no? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> September so, sounds really good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do So just to let people know what Mary was talking about last, I think it was last year, we decided to have August free. August free or one, one meeting, one meeting we off? August, we have one meeting in August. We have one meeting in August. Last year? 
this year. No, last yeah. year though, I think we had. Do we have it. We only skipped one meeting, but okay, I right, didn't skip two. Okay. But nice try. Well, whatever. Yeah. My, I trust your memory is better than mine. All right. So we nice, only have one meeting in August. We have nothing on the agenda in August yet. Oh, so let uh, so okay. here's the problem though. If we're going to actually attempt to solve something for the the school bus situation, um, school starts in yeah, end of August. August. Yeah, would need to be done soon. It's not going to happen by August, but I mean, let's, least, let's, uh, can we meet at seven? If we're going to have one meeting in August, can we have two meetings that start at seven in July? Sure. Yeah. What, what, I thought we already did that. What authority do we have over the school bus situation? The road. To simply put, it's the road. The road acceptance. So that's the bottom line. If I may, um, it does the timing work to have a meeting in July to determine if if there if it was determined that the planning board wants to accept the road no. to then advertise for a special town meeting to no. then open. Yeah. No, it right. doesn't work by it doesn't work by August, but I mean by the end of August for sure. But let's at least start the conversation on the twenty second, starting at seven. For Legacy Farms North Road. Sounds good. Does, Sounds anybody, does anybody significant need to be invited that would have help us with the jurisdiction of that? Well, I definitely, uh, you know what? Maybe we, you can trust the chair and the, the okay. and, and we'll think about that because I think that that's an excellent idea, mm -hmm. but on the fly, I don't have all the answers. Maybe DPW? Certainly DPW should be invited. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I think the school committee should be in on the conversation too, and possibly the board of selectmen who did the ribbon cutting. The select board. <laughs> yeah. um, and DPW yeah. here, we can talk about Rafferty Road as and well. The the road and the repair on Rafferty Road, and also what the difference is um, between the pieces of Legacy Farms North that existed before and the one that's new, just so we understand the parameters of what we're understanding. Yes, Roy. Uh, the former Rafferty Road. I'm getting like narrow. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's your job, but you're sitting next to The road became, as you know, Legacy North because I think it was, I don't know if it was a police, a fire, someone wanted one length of road going all the way through so, so there wasn't confusion. That road has been in disrepair for many years. I think it's gotten a little worse with the, they did the entrance to the LNG, but that road has had significant movement and cracks in it for a long, long time. Yeah, so I, I do not disagree, but part of what we're going to have to figure out is the Legacy Farms North, as part of the Osmud, right, that we didn't think of all these little, little things when we were talking about that. So we're going to have to have a plan for the entirety of the road, but I fully embrace that, um, that old Rafferty Road was a tiny, rickety uh, road before we made it into Legacy Farms North. We just have to figure out a way forward that makes sense. Great. Thank you. One last question. Yes. Um, moving a road from a private way to a public way, are we going to, do we have cost information to know like what that impact is? There is a whole process that goes with, with that for sure. Um, and uh, cost is, is, from my perspective, cost is going to be a bit of a player in that there's um, that potentially we, we need to um, contemplate a performance bond so that at the end of the end of everything the road is in the situation that if we accepted it right if we entertained the concept of, of accepting it mm -hmm. we'd have to have a whole understanding of what that meant and what it was going to look like at the end of all the construction that happens on the roads that are off that spine road. Okay. Excellent question. So, to the chair, though, I think the normal process, though, is the roads are built to our standards, yes. our regulations. So there should normally there shouldn't be a cost to accept it from private to public. It's just a town meeting. Yes, we accept it. But a oh, special so town meeting is, is not free. It, yeah. Huh? Having a special town meeting. Right, 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 right. I mean, well, normal. right. Special town meeting is not free. Also, you know, uh, publicly maintaining the road and so forth is not free. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, cost implications play in there. And this would be different, right? This is different than anything we've done before. And we've had this conversation when we were talking about the LNG plan about what was going to be the, you know, sort of the outfall from no, the trucks. No, this is different. This is different. This is entirely different different but I understand you're making the connection this is this is different in that we are contemplating try, trying to see if the all the players in the, the um, game oh, will accept, consider the accepting a road 
that is still has a lot of development happening off of it, right? So ordinarily, if you have a, a road with development, you don't accept the road until everything is where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. This spine road goes through. So Gary posited the, the idea, and we've talked a little bit about it in that, like, like Hayden Row is a road that goes through and it could have a development off of it. Hayden Row is a fully accepted road. It's just different though. It, without a doubt, it's gonna be a different question. However, without accepting the road, we're gonna have a very hard time getting school buses to pick up what is going to be in a greater and greater and greater number of school kids. The problem that we had this year is just gonna get exponentially bigger. So it's, this is an attempt to see if this is a way to, um, to address the whole thing. Um, one way first, like the most permanent way first. I don't even know if it's possible. But members of the select board or school committee may have other alternatives. They may. Too. They may. Yeah. And, 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 to, one last and question. to the chair, it was a state grant that, that built that built this road, so the state might be involved in its permission as well as to whether it's established. I don't well. think so, but we can ask that question. Uh, every question is a question. I was just going to joke, if only we had a select board person that, board that could be that here. Was here. It was right here. Yeah. But look! I know. Oh! Did you have one more thing? Um, just does wood of this road and the school bus dilemma need to be approved before the start of the school year? It can't, but but it should. It can't. <laughs> no, there's not enough time, right? So if it gets approved in the middle of the school year, does that mean then buses would go down it and be able to pick up kids? Yes. So, yes. Okay. But the school yeah. would have to work that out with the bus contractor, right? Or I guess they're, no. they're already no, picking them up. A, just a, a, they're, they've signed the contract for to provide uh, buses. I, I mean, I don't know. The fire it's probably still that. the same bus, yeah. To but actually, that question, um, what is the process? How long well, does it take? You know take? what? Why We're going to talk about it when we put it on the agenda. Okay. And so, it, I don't think that Patrick and uh, Rob have that document we received about the busing thing because I think that we got that before they were on the boards. So maybe we could. That would answer some of your questions. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Right, and the issue is they have to drive like a mile down the road to drop their kids off at the bus stop. Yeah, I heard. You're aware of that. No, he was, he was, he was, he was here. The campaign. Yeah, he was here. Campaign yeah. that when I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. meet the candidates tonight. It was very well discussed. Oh. Okay. So if if I may. Yes, John. Please again, John jump Cameron, in. One David Joseph. Um, yeah, to the to the chair's point. What when we did the Osmond, we never tweaked our bylaws to take on a you know a decade long project. And normally, with the when a when a project is finished, we accept the roads. Um, but in the, in the last couple of town meetings, if you notice, we have accepted like six, eight, ten roads at a time for old developments that we that the town had been taking care of. Buses had been driving into those neighborhoods. Um, the town had been plowing. The town had been picking up trash. The town had been has been doing everything. And now with this with this road, um, to the chair's point again, we had a ribbon cutting. We opened it up to, to the fanfare of taking away 15 or 20 percent of the traffic that normally would have gone downtown and that people get off of it and, and get onto 85 without uh, clogging up downtown. So the town is utilizing it, even, even with just the binder code on it right now. The um, Legacy Farm people are plowing it and, and maintaining it, but it was one of these things and that's why I was coming to see if, the, if the, this could be a hybrid of some sort, since we use it as a as a town road, and 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 if there's something that we could just work out and make it work, because we've never had a plan a, a development this big before, and, and how do we get around it? I don't think we've ever. So that's why that. that's why I've been hanging around all night. Well, perfect. <laughs> so so do come back when we actually. No, it's have been, it's, it's, it's always fun. I, I loved being on. We know um, why the, the the school is pushing back on the buses, though. So yeah. actually, well, we are, we are okay. going to adjourn, yes. right? And we yeah. can ask the I'll school talk to John about. The um, but we, we do want to have the fuller discussion, um, and I think we do want um, the Board of Selectmen who are players in this process and the school committee certainly who are players in this process. And if um, the, the bottom line is, is if there's a way that we can support a solution that works, I want us to be supporting that. Is there any responsibility, just one question, is there any responsibility that we have to the state for... Stop, stop. It's not on the agenda. So. Not, not, not anymore at all? Okay. Okay. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second.
Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Actually, it is kind of a.